I said I'd, uh, th if your uh, approval, take the report as a read and just make it really clear that um, my recommendation to council is is that option one is the option that is put forward for council for consideration, which uh, that version of that policy commences at page 83 of your agenda. So I just want to be, once again reiterate that that's the policy position that I'm recommending to you for adoption, starting at page 83. And I just also drew to your attention that that, that option of that policy uh, in it, it contains some what appear to be track changes. That is purely a uh, an editorial error. Those track changes are meant to be read as part of, of the actual policy itself. I just want to make that make that clear. And I'm happy to take any questions from elected members. Uh, so we have questions, uh, Councillor Gary. Thank you. Um, Just on page, uh, so page 55, 65, paragraph 53, um, can you explain the second sentence in paragraph 53, consequently the policy has been revised to remove all refer references to the, uh, what's this one called? Yeah, Partially so. operative district plan, compliance with components, com performance standards and assessment criteria and affordability criteria. Yeah. I don't understand what that means. Yeah, okay. So, um, <coughs> Councillor Mellor, the, the notified version of the policy, the one that was consulted on, is included as attachment one. And in attachment one, that, that version of the policy included a, a number of schedules in there. One of those was uh, references to um, relevant parts of the part of the operative district plan that were um, contained in the policy as being relevant considerations for considering SHA applications. So through... Uh, through Sorry, stop there. So you're saying the partially operative district plan had some uh, performance standards, assessment criteria, affordability criteria, <coughs> which you... Gone. Is, is that what you're talking about? Yep. So if you look at the, in attachment one of, 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 the, of the report, <coughs> yep. um, there are a number of schedules. And if you look at Schedule 4, Residential Development Quality Expectations. What page is that? That's on page 82 of your agenda. And in that, that included specific references back to the part, part of the Operative District Plan. A number of submissions said that, that, that the inclusion of those types of provisions was, was too prescriptive. Oh, OK. OK. So, 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 so i just put this in the context. And so what they're, they're saying, parts of the Partially Operative District Plan are too prescriptive. This is possibly a cause for the need to have special housing accords no, no. so why would you keep those things in there no 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 what the 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 the, the overall um, message coming through the submissions on these points was that the housing accords and special housing areas act uh, sets up a completely different legislative framework to consider residential development um, there was no need to include this level of detail relating to the partly operative district plan in our policy. So it wasn't a comment. In our special housing, in our special housing policy. area policy. It wasn't a. <coughs> the, 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 the um, submissions r relating to, to these matters were not about the district plan. It was about the policy and being yeah. overly prescriptive. Yeah. We've listened to those submissions and we've drawn those parts of, uh, of the, the, the policy in, in the recommended version. Okay, so did our initial policy, SHA policy, did refer to those parts of the publicly district... Uh, yes, it, district it made explicit references in Schedule 4, okay. right, and they've been removed. So the, um, re, uh, the submitters said, let's sidestep those things. Those, those things are holding us un unnecessary in, in, in your SHA policy. Look, I'm paraphrasing. I, wouldn't, I, I don't think that's what they were saying. They were saying the intent of the Housing Accords <laughs> and Special Housing Areas Act is to enable supply, yep. um, and that there are... You know that there are strategic land use considerations that should be contemplated when determining whether or not an SHA should be recommended to the minister. Doing an evaluation against these types of matters that are referred to in the district plan isn't necessary to be included is in the or policy. Isn't is not necessary to be included in the policy. Okay. I think I get it. Know what that means. Okay. In the paragraph 55 at the bottom of that page. Sorry, paragraph 55? Yeah, 55. Yeah, it refers to the city's strategic land use pattern yep. as set out in the Hamilton Housing Accord. Yes, so... What's that? Okay, the Hamilton Housing Accord is... This is not the special housing accord. What's... 
Okay, so we've got a. You're, I'm asking you to to endorse a special housing area's policy. Yes. The special housing area policy relates to the Hamilton Housing Accord. So the Hamilton Housing Accord that's included. That's what was signed. By Ma 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 Mayor Andrew King and, and, and Minister Smith Matthew. in December last year, and it's included <coughs> in your in your um, in your documents, and yep. it's included as attachment number six. So in that accord, it so that's what we might call Lockie, the enabling legislation. Is that what we would call it? Yes. Thank you. Yep. So the housing accord um, outlines the way in which central government and ourselves will work together to advance housing supply. And in that, it talks about development that's being enabled through the Accord is um, will be generally consistent with the some of the uh, planning provisions that we've got at the moment, the high level ones, so, right? So the the policy uh, has been amended to reflect that in uh, so if you go on page 84 of your of your agenda, in the locational considerations under paragraph 15, paragraph 15 C. C, and it talks about that. So this is effectively the types of things that that uh, would be considered by staff and ultimately the council, because only the council can can make the recommendation to the minister as to whether or not an SHA should be declared. The minister has the final decision. These are these are the things that we're saying that should be should be uh, considered when, uh, when, when evaluating an application for SHA status. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so we're saying that we will um, judge an application for a SHA and some of the um, parameters or what do you want to call it, some of the things we will use to judge, some of the standards we'll assess the application for will be these things. That's, that's c contained in um, primarily in, in <coughs> sections or paragraphs 14 and, 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 and 15 of, uh, of the policy, the recommended policy. Okay, thank you. I think um, on paragraph 78 on page 67, there's reference to there has been the remo there has been the removal of SHA assessment against partially operative district plan performance standards. So does that so is that saying that the SHA has removed well has removed some standards has, has said we can curtail some of the standards that we thought were important in the POP PODP and we're now going to sidestep those. No, so it goes back to my earlier comment. So the policy has re has removed direct references to the part of the operative district plan. Yep. yep. So that, that's it's just reiterating our earlier conversation okay. on that matter. So it's the same thing. It's really. the same thing. Um, <coughs> and because um, the and in addition, uh, the those matters need to be addressed in any event under the Act when a resource consent application for a special housing area ultimately comes to council. Okay. So the, the, one of the one of the things that came out in the submissions about no need to have the PODP information is because it's dealt with through a resource consent in any event. Okay, thank you. And there was one other thing, and I can't find it, but I do remember myself saying this. One thing where it says something about um, the policy shall be subservient to the Act. The Act it's referring to is the Housing Accord Act, not the RMA. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Oh, okay, thank you. So I'll just Thank you. Um, flag that I'll move the staff recommendation, which is option one. So, sorry. Uh, um, so option one. Option one is a staff recommendation. Yep. So um, seconded by Jeff. Thank you. Yep. Um, so Paula. Uh, sorry, excuse me, Councillor Southgate. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> uh, so looking at the one that you're recommending, you've um, removed all the, the outcomes, you've, you've streamlined it what, and you've taken all the outcomes out. So where do the outcomes now sit in terms of, I always believe a policy should have, um, should be measurable against outcomes. Uh, I'm talking about, maybe I've got it wrong because actually I was quite confused with the back and forward between the various things I know that you've got the, and the strike change thing was a bit confusing until you just said that before but 
Um, you have um, on page 88, there is a list of the, the, these housing outcomes will cover. And then that's, that's gone. The also, the other question I want to ask is um, around page 84, paragraph, uh, excuse me, paragraph E, where you were previously, there was um, some attention given to social, recognised social housing providers. That's gone. Can you explain why that's gone? Yeah, look, that's in response to the submissions. Um, and it, and uh, number one, about not discriminating between any particular type of developer, number one. And number two, two, um, two staff recommendation better reflect the purpose of the Act. So the purpose of the Act talks about achieving affordability through supply. So we've, 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 we've taken that out in option one. Um, it is included in option two, but option one is one that aligns more closely to, to the Act itself. So, okay, so just in, I know it can, can split hairs legally over interpretation sometimes. Affordability through supply, I do get that. I do think that's the, the, global, the global over the position, but um, there is a nature of supply, isn't there, as well? It's not just numbers, affordability through sheer numbers, but you could interpret supply to be the type of how you're nodding, look, run. So yeah, I'm not wrong to suggest that you could, you, you, you wouldn't be um, completely outside of the interpretation of the Act if you did make some. Um, recognition of types of supply or what the supply might constitute? Yeah, I think that, that concept is, is accepted. It seems orthodox that, that you, you can, you know, controlling the nature of the supply of itself might deliver the outcomes that the Act is looking for. Mm. The, I think the messages that were coming through from the submissions were mm. really to be a little less prescriptive in terms of how you... Um, how you deliver on the intent of the Act. So I think that, that what the staff have done in terms of removing that as a requirement is to say, well, look, we'll be open to anyone who wants to come forward and promote an idea that can deliver the purpose of the Act rather than prescribing the, the, the mechanisms or the pathways. Mm. So it's, again, it's just a response to the message coming through in the submissions to be a little bit less prescriptive in the, in the policy approach. Yeah, I, I sat through the submissions, and, and um, yes, I did hear that message. At the same time, I also think I heard from other people that they would like a greater emphasis on the social, not social housing per se, but community housing that meets a different sort of need other than just, you know. So I did hear a broader range of submission, I thought, than what you've just described. Can I, can I just add to the to the answer then, because I think it addresses that second point. I think mm. one of the other things that um, that came through in, in reviewing the submissions and dealing with that point was um, refocusing on the purpose of the Act, which is about housing affordability and delivering affordability through supply. Um, and so um, taking a policy position which was not necessarily addressing some of those social issues that were emerging in the submissions, but staying on the supply, on the supply issue. Um, and I think there's a reference in the report to if the council was minded to, 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 to address some vehicles for, um, you know, to deal with that social housing um, question. There are some suggestions in the staff report as to how that might um, how that might come about, but certainly the policy itself has been drafted to not address that issue mm. and to stay focused on the purpose of the Housing Affordability Act. Okay, I might have some comment on that. I still think there's some grey in there. It's not that it's not totally black black and white. It's a matter of inter interpretation um, because I, I don't know as I'm talking about provision of purely social housing, I'm talking about a range of models of housing that mm -hmm. to, to address affordability rather than pure quantum. Yep. And I think, I think that's a reasonable... Um, so, uh, so then removing, removing um, 
um, the opportunity for some preference to people who can provide different types of housing, which was what the, which just happened in paragraph E to be social housing, but that's just one type of one type mm. of solution. I wondered why you'd done that, and um, um, yeah. I, yeah, okay. I'll think about it some more, actually, and listen what other people's questions are. Mm. Councillor Pesco. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> um, first uh, sort of tranche of questions are around, and, and Gary touched on, the, uh, um, Councillor Mallet touched on this, is the Gary. removal of any mention of the proposed um, operative district plan. Do you think that's wise in the context that the district plan will still and will always be a consideration that has to be taken into account when a SHAR application, come, a SHAR application comes in? Sorry, um, uh, Councillor Pascoe. Um, the, the PODP and the provisions in it will be uh, taken into account through any qualifying development. So if an SHA is declared, it has to be dealt with as part of that application, but it is at the at the bottom end of the matters for consideration. So there's a there's a there's a weighting in order of preference yep, of the yep, types of I things you have that. to consider. Yep. Um, my view is uh, the policy retains the the types of uh, the, the the types of things that would ordinarily be considered uh, by the PODP um, can still be considered through any SHA application because of the 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 wording that's considered in the locational considerations. So where we're talking about at a very broad level, right, we're asking um, to, for, for staff to assess any SHA applications uh, and how they um, might materially compromise council's strategic land use planning. And then it sets out areas that are zoned in the PDP where we think uh, that they're, they're, they're not suitable. So they are, um, they are still things that need to be thought about uh, through any SHA. They're just not as explicitly um, referred to in the level of detail that was included in Schedule 4 of the policy that was notified. But do you think effectively it's being swept under the carpet a little bit in terms of the expectations that the applicant might have? Um, my view isn't. I, I wouldn't have recommended this to council if, if, I, if I thought that that was the case, um, because I think they are those, um, you know, planning matters that need to be considered for any SHA application are, are relevant matters. I'm satisfied that, that, that there's uh, enough uh, material in here for the for the types of things that would be contemplated through the. PODP to be addressed through the policy. So what would happen if the application was at odds with the partly operative district plan and it was clear in councils? Well, first of all, it would need to come back to council, wouldn't it? For Absolutely. Approval? So the, 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 the process is, is that um, w pending any, any approval of the policy today, we'll be seeking expressions of interest in September. And once that expression of interest period has, has closed, we'll, we'll, we'll bring a report to council as soon as we can to let you know what's in the mix. And then we'll go through an evaluation process, a very detailed one. Um, so ultimately, any recommendation to you based on an evaluation by staff is how, how an SHA application stacks up against the policy as a whole and the degree to which something compromises council's land use planning framework is one of those considerations mm -hmm. whether or not it in itself that that thing on its own would be enough to uh, force staff to recommend uh, that a site isn't declared in SHA uh, would really depend on where it where it fits in with the rest of the policy okay okay so if if we had a situation where the SHA application was at odds and council felt, council staff and the recommendation to council was that they believed it shouldn't go ahead or it should go through the plan change process, which of course is more cumbersome as I understand it. Um, does, the, does the applicant have an option of fast tracking that or, or appealing against that decision and going straight to the minister or going through MV to to um, to challenge that decision? No, and the answer the answer to, uh, to to that 
that idea of sidetracking side a council decision is that there is no option. The only other option would be to commence a judicial review of the administrative decision to decline the SHA. Um, so, yeah, the, 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 there is always going to be that control that you can um, exert in terms of a proposed SHA. Um, and that's really what that evaluation criteria in, in section 15 of the policy is designed to do, yep. is to give you um, an opportunity to assess a proposed SHA <coughs> to the extent that it might be inconsistent with um, the, the proposed district plan. Um, you evaluate the, the, the nature of that inconsistency, the significance of the inconsistency, what its impacts might be in terms of infrastructure provision and planning and so on, um, and then you make a decision on the facts as to whether you're prepared to get on board with that proposed SHA or if the, the inconsistencies and the effects of the inconsistencies are just too significant. So you've got that decision-making power. Um, the policy sets that up. Okay, and another question is around um, paragraph 65 suggests that a quarter, which I think is three months, would be the turnaround period for each application. Um, should it be, is, I presume it's three months from the initial application? Is yeah. that what we intended in terms of start? In terms of it being turned, uh, does, in terms of the turnaround for a decision? Yeah, that's that's our that's our intent. So we would, as I say. Um, Call for expression of interest in, in September. Yep. Bring to you what's been uh, what's been applied for. Yep. There won't be a full evaluation at that point. That's really just about visibility for you guys. Um, and then we'll endeavour to do a full a full assessment and, and report back to you at the end of the quarter. Now, um, it might it might be for a scenario might be is that let's say for example we had ten applications. Two of them we might say to you we don't think there's any. Uh, any merit in these and, and we're recommending we don't proceed. Um, five of them might be uh, very simple because we're, you know, the, the original or the intent of the accord itself and the policy is around those small scale you know, pockets of opportunity. So they might be small in nature, all the infrastructure is in place, we're, we're good to go and, and the full assessment has been done. Others might, might be larger uh, larger projects that we we will not be in a position to have completed the assessment, but we'll just be updating you of where we're at mm -hmm. at that okay. point because we, some some of these might take longer than three months. And I assume that you'll put in place some mitigations that if the application is such that it's hasn't got any legs to it, you'll be letting the applicant know yeah, sooner absolutely. than the three months, sooner yeah, than uh, letting yeah. them wait for the three uh, months absolutely, to say yeah. to say no. Uh, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll be in constant contact with any anyone who who formally lodges an expression of interest. Okay. So, what sort of number? What's your expectation of numbers um, if this all goes through? And the and uh, what sort of expectation have you got as to the likely applications that might be sitting out there in the wings at the moment? I'd, I'd say there's at least um, at least half a dozen. Uh, potential expressions of interest that might come in this year. Okay, okay, and there might there might be more than that, but I'm I'm reasonably confident of at least half a dozen. <clears throat> and how are we going to fund these? I, I, there's nothing. There's no. I mean, it, it suggests in the paper in your paper that it's self-funding, but presumably we've got to have a bunch of staff already up to up to scratch, yep, ready yep, to go. So uh, sitting. Well, well, not. I wouldn't say. I don't mean this in a derogatory <laughs> sense, no. but. But being there and, and, and ready to go as soon as these applications hit, knowing that there's a kind of a 90-day turnaround. Um. Yeah. So if you, the, the recommended policy, uh, op, the option one, paragraph 22, is that we're looking for full cost recovery. Yes, saw that. Yep. So in terms yep. of, um, in terms of a um, financial uh, impact on the council, it's, uh, it'll be at, at worst cost neutral. Um, <coughs> So that'll be in accordance with our standard fees and charges so yep. that we do for, for, for similar types of projects. Um, but yes, we've got, uh, it, there, there, we will have, uh, there will be an impact on, on staff resources, but we've known this has been coming for a while, so we've set up the, the processes and systems internally to, to be ready for, for any applications, uh, expressions of interest should they be lodged in, in September. Uh, and it'll be uh, resourced through uh, staff both within uh, my unit 
planning guidance unit and, and city infrastructure. And um, if needed, we can call on an external consultant resource. Okay. Is there any, is there a significant difference in the costing, whether it's recovered or not, between option one and option two? Uh, in my opinion, there'd be no, no, no difference in, no, in no terms of the, difference no, no significant difference between the two difference. if if, no. if option two was taken as a preferred option. No, no okay. in terms of okay. uh, in terms of an impact on staff resources, no. Um, on page eighty six, uh, in the in the revised policy, um, paragraph six, uh, which is in red, which looks like it's a changed one, um, is it wise to have in a policy um, the metric of six point eight? the value of median income when that may be a, an historical figure yep. um, and 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 it, given that it's not compared with anything else you know as to what other cities median would be and what and and given that there's no definition to what is the affordable you know what what metric is yeah. is what uh, M, is it MB yeah MB calls an affordable value, so, and look, that it will change, and that that six point eight will change over time. Look, it's it's a good point, but it was put in there because for option two, option two retains some affordability components, and uh, the reason that was included there is to make a clear, um, a clear upfront reference to the fact that if you go for option two, there's some affordability provisions in there about. Uh, section size and GFA, and that's almost like a problem statement. So that 6.8, when it talks about um, where we're deemed unaffordable, the what is deemed unaffordable in terms of the of the housing accords and special housing area act is a multiple of five. Right? So so you can't even have, uh, um, or sorry, you can have a, a special housing uh, sorry housing accord if council wants to. But uh, which we did in this instance, but you can't get, you can't have that unless you're scheduled under the Act, and the mechanism, the trigger for scheduling, is once a uh, a, a metropolitan or a district council's median house price goes over that that, that threshold figure of five. Okay. So we we were, we were added to that schedule back in I think from memory 2014 or 2015. So that's why that was included in there. So if we adopt option one, that paragraph will get removed. We could remove policy. it if that was, um, or we could amend it to, to better reflect the, the the relationship to the Act itself, or it could just simply be removed. Just on that, if I may, if you want to just signal amendment, um, Mayor Andrew, um, I'll question, I'll go to my question shortly, but I just want to signal an amendment. Um, and, Sorry, mate. and just one final um, question or a, or a suggestion, and uh, that's also on page 86, um, paragraph 13. It's probably not a question, it's more of a suggestion. Could you add, and, and um, there might be some disagreement around the table on this, but at the end of what you've got there in red, application, all the overall objectives and intent of the proposed operative district plan? Or am I barking at the sides to the fact that you did not want the, no the partly operative district plan to be mentioned in the policy? Um, can I just answer this? Firstly, just to be very clear, page 86 that you're reading from, yep. that's the second option oh, policy. I, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So, oh, so just, okay. To be, just to be very clear, the recommended option is the option which starts at page 83 okay, okay. and finishes okay. at I've, page... I've obviously overlooked that in terms Page 85. Of, yeah. No, it's a little bit con confusing because there's a few options there, but the, the point so is... So if we, if we adopt option one instead of option two... This is not this in will here. Be, this will be a non-event. That's okay. right. Okay, all right. Well, I'll reserve that in case um, there is a change to move to option two. Um, thank you for answering the questions. Siggy, <laughs> did you drop off? Or... Yep. Uh, Councillor Taylor. Thanks, uh, Mayor Andrew. Uh, your question for Luke, I think. In, in option one, page 84, F at the bottom of the page, design quality, the extent to which the proposed SHA adheres to the key urban design qualities expressed in the ministry, blah, 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 and so on. I'm just after um, some clarification on what, what that gives us in terms of protection as a council. For design standards, where does that where does that place us? Um, 
so first of all, if you think of the matters and uh, how design quality can be controlled through an SAJ and any subsequent applications, there's two components to it. The first one is understanding uh, sufficiently at a almost a, at a concept level, right, that a project is going to satisfy the, um, the 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 policy provisions contained in the urban design protocol for declaration of an SAJ. So those they talk about seven uh, key components. So this is a this is a, a document that's been developed by the Ministry for the Environment. It was developed uh, more than ten years ago. We're a signatory um, to uh, to the design protocol, as are most metropolitan councils, and it talks about um, what they call the the seven the seven C's of, of quality urban design. And it covers things like context, character. Uh, choice, connection. So if you think about um, the degree to which a proposal might be compatible with the existing environment, it's certainly picked up in the in the urban design protocol. So that so that's your filter at the at the at the high level stage. Yep. So that gives the uh, the council some confidence around at a, at a, at a conceptual level what this uh, what subsequent projects might look like. In the actual act itself, there are limitations around uh, around height that are that are provided for, and then any subsequent applications which are submitted, uh, the provisions of the of the district plan for the for for that zone are also taken into account as part of the as part of the assessment. So um, I um, I think you you pick it up those design quality issues and the degree to which a a, a potential SHA would be compatible or not with an existing environment through those locational considerations okay. in the policy in, in C and then once again in F in terms of design quality um, and then subsequently through future qualifying development applications to actually develop the SHA area. Okay, thank you. Councillor Mark. Um, thanks, Mayor Andrew. Um, just uh, a couple of questions here, mainly around um, affordability. Just looking at the table one on page 67, could you please give me a bit more detail? I noticed that these other councils with SHAs have affordability criteria in them, and um, Christchurch doesn't. Wellington's about to. Can you please give me some detail as to what their affordability criteria is? Is it around the size of the sections, or...? Um, Councillor Bunny, yes, it is. It's a mix. The, the the Auckland one is very prescriptive, so that was actually related to the the, the sale of uh, the, the price point okay. of of um, of the dwellings that were enabled under the SHA, uh, and that has actually been found to be very difficult to administer. Yep. yep. Um, because it provides a first of all, um, very difficult obligations on the council to monitor what those sections and, and, and houses were sold at, and then retaining that information, uh, and then ensuring that they're subsequently sold on for at a particular sub-market. It's very, very difficult to do yeah. that. Uh, and you may have seen in the, in the media recently that the council itself doesn't actually have adequate figures around how those provisions are actually tracking. Um, the, the, the rest is... Um, is, is that right? Sorry, Queenstown have got created with some of their stuff. Yeah, look, they've got a whole um, whole mayoral initiative around housing affordability w above and beyond what's SHAs. contained in the SHAs, and it's exactly the same as what's happening in Wellington. That there's a there's a whole there's a whole um, dedicated project of the council looking at housability, housing affordability in its totality outside yeah. of what's being done in Hesha. So it is a it is a mix. So yeah. Some some look at price point. Some at sale, some at the at the um, at the, 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 the types of controls that were included in the, um, the, the, the the version that we sent for for public comment, uh, and uh, which have been retained in option two. Okay, cool. Um, thank you. So just with with actually no, we'll hold you on that one just a little bit longer. Um, with uh, regards to their um, SHA policies, do you know apart from Auckland with the the price point? Injection, which yeah, you're right, doesn't work. Um, you don't know anything else other than the size. Are any of them co-working with assisted housing organisations, for example? Or? Um, look, I, I can't answer that. I don't know whether or not they're actually um, 
the degree to which the, they've prescribed in their policy that they will work with other providers. I know that they have those types of uh, provisions that are included in their accords. Um, and certainly there is uh, lots of work going on with other housing providers outside of their accord yeah. and outside their special housing area right. obligations. There were some media reports recently in, um, about Auckland having trouble with house flipping and the likes, and what were some of the, uh, the pitfalls they were finding with theirs, other than the... Uh, Auckland were having some, some issues with developers, like, for example, I think Emma holding on to properties longer than the, the term allowed and then... Them yeah, so in right. relation to the special housing area enabled dwellings, the issue has been around the, the, re, the retained affordability. So yeah. where they've said, these dwellings, here's your project, let's say there's 100 dwellings, X percent have to be sold at 75% of the market rate. Right, right. Now that's, that's, a, that's a very difficult thing to administer. Yeah. Over in perpetuity. Um, and um, it's just been... Um, in, and in some ways, it, what has resulted is that the, some of those um, some of those developers have not actually given effect to those affordable dwellings. They haven't built those components of projects, right. so they've built everything else and left those other projects yeah. and, and not actually yeah. not actually brought them on stream. Okay, um, can I perhaps put a amendment up now? Is it the right time to do it? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, staff have got roughly uh, the rough wording of it. Um, that we go with option number one, but we approve that, sorry, that I just want to tweak that wording a little bit, that a minimum of 20% of total uh, SHA stock over each year be set aside for co-housing initiatives. Uh, anyone be seconding me on that? Can I... <coughs> Questions? You, yeah, you go first, Luke. You're, you're looking at yeah, look, 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 I just want to just speak to that motion that, the, that um, there is nothing prohibiting a co-housing scenario totally. being developed under this policy. So um, notwithstanding your proposed amendment, if someone wants to do a co-housing project, yep. they can do that under this policy. No, I get that. I'm, well, I guess what I'm trying to signal is that we, we are keen on that okay. uh, at this level. Yep. Um, I mean, if the number's too high for a second, I can drop it down and <laughs> butter yeah. it. Bing. Not on, yeah, but not on each individual one. No, no, on I know, I know. But, but yeah, yeah. Yes, it would. Yep. To be something. <coughs> yeah, to be for the likes of your habitats and your humanities and the likes. So, if anyone can help me on the wording of it and to perhaps get it onto the table, um, can I just, if I can, Your Worship, uh, and again, just to, you know, again, without trying to uh, denounce the <coughs> the amendment, but the concept if you talk about it was was always. Uh, right back to the accord signing was around trying to affect uh, house affordability through supply. Yes. And then, as uh, Luke's pointed out in Queenstown, then there are other initiatives that may happen outside of that policy. Totally. And, and part of the rationale for stripping down the policy and the feedback we received from developers was the more criteria you put in that makes it um, more directive actually and disables the ability to provide more supply overall. Mm. Whereas if you take away a lot of that prescription ability, you can still do supply across the market provision, yep. which may include affordable housing, and mm. we, we talked about ground for, but that would be there anyway, because the market, if, if our data says the market asks for it, they should be responding to that. Mm. Mm. Um, and therefore, and doesn't prohibit small or housing providers to likewise to do yep. co-housing initiatives anyway. No, I, to I totally take your point, and it's probably that's more of a debate point down the, when we get into the debate about it. Um, I guess, and that's the advice we've had from developers, but I'm suggesting the other sector, other than just property developers. So I wonder if I might, and if 20% of people are balking at that, would anyone second me at lower? I don't want to get into a, an irregular so, fitting situation. So, Councillor, are you suggesting that that would be... Um, I suggest that becomes a part of our, our brief with the Special Housing Accord. As part of the policy. As part of it, yep. So that would have to be added, what you're saying is... If to to, to the policy. Added to the to policy. policy. Yeah, to the policy. Yep. Uh, option one, yep. <coughs> so that would be the only... Proviso that I would ask to be put on there. In I think we should have a discussion about yeah. that. Yeah. Or Council Eglinton gets into it too much. I was trying to be helpful. No, thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah, it's good. Um, I might die. So I don't have a second, eh? Oh, well, okay. I'll do it pro forma. Thank you. Oh, you're going to see. Yeah. Speak up, Sigi. You're not normal. Thank you, You're I appreciate hitting, it. hitting me down too much, so I'm so quiet now. <laughs> okay, so can we discuss that then? 
Um, what did you want to discuss, or questions-wise? <laughs> yeah, so the intention of it is basically oh, to earmark it. The list, but apart from that, I wouldn't mind just... Uh, oh, there I am, back again. Just, just point of order. Uh, I, I was next yep. in the order. We, we're in, still in questions, aren't yes. we? Yeah, we and are. Mar yeah. Mark's just put up a, an amendment, but we're still in question time, aren't we? Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. I just want to make it clear for people, so if you want to see So I'm not sure where we're going. Um, can, uh, yeah. Sorry, have I missed... Could you... Could you... Yeah. Could you I, I, well, I don't know about yeah. the area. I think Mark is still on his questions. Isn't yeah, that's um, what I no, thought. That's, that's all the questions yeah. I've got. Unless anyone's got any questions, they want to question me. Anyway. Could you explain yeah. what co-housing initiatives... Yeah, I guess what I'm trying to trying to get at is the uh, the Habitats for Humanities, the Tainui's, the, the outfits who are prepared to um, invest some of their money in... Um, more affordable housing type initiatives as opposed to just asking the developers to make stuff smaller. So I see that as a more effective way of uh, addressing affordability than just purely supply. And the only initiative I see in here, unfortunately, is size. So what I'm trying to do is say, yep, keep 80% for developers to do what they will and don't expect them to be the ones to deal with affordability by the nature of their houses. You know, don't don't impose it upon them, and I'm, I guess I'm debating now. But I guess what I'm trying to say is, I don't want to see the developers be expected to build low-cost housing because that's unreasonable. That's not what they do. Um, and yes, yes, they would actually. So like you'd them. require no, habitat. No, you'd say somebody challenge it in court. Yeah, I'd say that the people like there's I know, for example, there's groups, trusts around at the moment who are trying to address affordable housing by getting together and co-funding development. So if there's a hundred houses that are going to be built under a special housing court. That couldn't go ahead until another 20% were being built by... Not of each housing. one, no, of our total so housing So it would stop the other 100 from being built? So what would happen is if we get to the end of the year uh, and we haven't reached that 20% <coughs> quota, yep, absolutely, we'd stop until they came along and then so we'd start stop, another year. So you'd stop housing being built? Yeah. So what's, what's a, called what, an unintended yeah. consequence? So no, they, what, they, but Gary, I, I'm firmly of the belief it wouldn't stop it being built. What's they the purpose of the Act? To address affordability. Supply, and does this fit into the purpose of the act? Um, well, if it if it suppresses supply, clearly not. So if that's the consequence of of that outcome, if I mean, I mean, the practical issue here is is I think is, is identified in the question and answer. If the twenty percent target is not met in any calendar year, does that mean that? The, the, the council then puts the brakes on further supply of SHAs until the 20% quota is met. Um, that has the potential to suppress supply, I would have thought. It's a break rather than a, a release. So perhaps there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's some work to be done around um, the enforceability and the practical application of the idea. Yeah. Um, perhaps uh, before, it, it, before it meets the purpose of the Act. Yeah. Would it help then if... Um, we did it for the first year uh, and reviewed it. And then if, it, if it's not working, then you can quite happily lift it to keep the supply going. Well, it is, but I'm just trying to, I'm trying to keep it on the table. If we could get, can we keep going with some questions? We've got that up there, and that might yeah. help Mark okay. clarify his point on that. Okay. I'm sorry to be so clumsy about it, but yeah. Councillor McPherson. Yeah, I've got a couple of questions, and, I, and because I like where he's coming from, but the wording... Is, is not going to work, okay. I think. But with our 50-50 infill greenfields requirement, now where where does that sit in our documents? Doesn't does it sit in the district plan that people apply for consents for, or is it somewhere else? How do you know? How do we know that we're going for 50-50? It's it's each a it's year? a it's a it's articulated in the Hamilton Urban Growth Strategy. It's, okay, a, it's so a policy it's a, position. It's in a strategy, it's in a, strategy. Um, a higher level thing, and down here is the district plan, and we try and with all sorts of encouragements and whatever, we try and make sure that's that's target is met. Yeah, and it's uh, so if you think that it's set out as a policy in hugs, and then it's reflected as best as we can to give effect to hugs through our zoning approach, yeah. right? And, and the controls that enable infill housing inside inside a ge in general residential area that's not greenfield. So if there was a, as well as that 50-50, a target and a strategy that hugs or one of the others, that 20% um, should be the target for affordable housing, and you'd have to have a definition of affordable, um, and you had <laughs> policy option one, is that a way to do it? Because I, 
I mean, uh, it's almost speaking to this. I, I, it's not going to work in a coercive way like that, but it could work as a target, and you, you try and achieve it. And you're like we do with the 50, the infill greenfill thing. We report back every, I can't remember how often, but we get reports back how we're going against that target, which is in the strategy. But it's not something that the, any one developer has to worry about. That's where I'm sort of coming from, if you get. Because I, I, I think there is a problem with, in Auckland, it's clearly been shown there's a problem with uh, affordable houses not being, or <coughs> SHA's not delivering the expected number of affordable houses. So how do you try and encourage that without trying to force it on every developer or every development? Is there a way, of, so I'm asking, is there a way of doing that by putting it in the higher level document as a vision slash target? Yep. Like we've done with that other one. Um, Your Worship, just to, just to that point, I think the, the short answer is yes, there is. Um, the, and it requires a little bit of linking between the various documents here, but the option one of the draft policy that you're, you're dealing with today, at the top of page 84 in the agenda, um, sets out a requirement in paragraph A that development um, within the proposed SHA will achieve the purpose of the Act, HASHA, uh, in a manner consistent with the Accord. And the Accord, of course, is the Hamilton Housing Accord, which is the precursor to this policy document. Now, I've got the Hamilton Housing Accord document <coughs> here, and it says, um, at paragraph three, or clause three of the Accord, development progressed through this Accord will generally be consistent with the Hamilton Urban Growth Strategy hugs and the strategic directions contained in the partly operative district plan and the RPS and the, the future-proof sub-regional growth strategy. So, to, to answer the point, if there was, for example, an amendment to HUGS to pick up on the, the, the policy intent here, and, and you had those targets embedded within those higher order planning documents, the linkages are here for you to then deliver it, because you can, when you go back to clause 14 of your policy, you need to approve us in SHA, which is consistent with your accord. So that uh, it's a little bit round. Would you need to it, it, would, would you need to approve every single SHA there, or SHAs all of them over time delivering on that policy? Well, I think that's the better approach. I think yeah. you know measuring the delivery of the, the the outcome over a period, as opposed to um, you know. Uh, development by but development or in a small time period I think is problematic and it gives rise to the kind of issues that have been identified that you know what happens if you haven't met your target at a particular point um, you know what's the penalty does it does the whole thing stall and therefore not serve the purpose of the act so I think you need to take a kind of a, a higher level approach yeah. to it and you need to measure it over a longer period yeah well, so that was the purpose of my question seeing if there's a way we could have try and deliver on that aim without tying developers or developments in knots. It seems like there's, but I don't know what the wording would be. But Lachlan's quick on his feet, so he could... <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I don't know. Is that what you're... Yeah, that's, that, that's the intention, Dave. Uh, you know, I don't want it to be restrictive, and I don't want us to get ourselves all tied up in that. Um, I just want to make sure that the wording is strong, that it's... And it's it wouldn't add anything to option one, Lachlan? I don't think it so. It would be something else we'd have to do. Yeah, I mean, we could... I'm just thinking about B. Um, <coughs> I mean, I think... So the, the, the problematic words in B at the moment is within the parentheses or the, the quote, it's to require. Um, I think that's a very prescriptive word. Um, and the other problem, I think, is over each year. So if, if there was a little bit of surgery done to those two parts of B... 20% yeah. um, over the totality of the SHA timing. Yeah, yeah. Would that over the life of the, the accord. Because it's only, uh, Mayor Andrew, it's what, the, the SHA accords three years or something, isn't it? Is that right? Three years. Three years. It might be, uh, if, you, if you link it to the, over the life of the accord, the other recommendation I, I would suggest for elected members is to think about the wording around co-housing. Yeah, yeah. I, think, I, I, ask I think you need to be clear. I, well, I think, it's, I think you're talking about social or and or affordable housing yeah. initiatives. Uh, I was going with affordable because that's in the SHA Act, isn't it? 
It's yeah, already, but so, social housing is they're registered social housing providers, so there's a very clear definition of what they are. So uh, they're rec under the MSC. So if you use both words, you pick up probably you, you might just capture more than what's <coughs> deemed to be. Well, there might actually be some developers that uh, would deliver there social are. housing that aren't in the register. That's true. It's so if you say and affordable right. and also, but look, it's uh, over you. That's my just my recommendation too. I think, I think the, the word co housing or the words co housing though is, is unclear. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. It's that's quite cool. restrictive too. All right, well, can I, can I say, and thanks for your indulgence, everybody, while I've clumsily, you know, yeah, walking my way through this. But, well, um, you're a radio <laughs> jock, that's why. <laughs> I've got 90 seconds and I've got to have an air break. Um, <laughs> approves the inclusion of the policy to uh, so target a 20%. Uh, oh, we don't need to say minimum. That's no. Right. So target 20% of. Well, no, you do need to say minimum. Uh, because it, it might help. Might help. Oh, yeah, good point, actually. Yeah. You say maximum, yeah. then fine's OK. Fine, okay. Yeah, you're right. OK, take a minute. Thanks, Gary, you're right. So, just got a question. Minimum. One's pro it's far away, Sorry, Paula, it won't be long. Um, One's a procedural question and around the timing of having to get this uh, through today. I'm not trying to delay it, but... If this is a significant issue, it, rather than I hate drafting on the fly, I hate this cross the table, bang a word and bang. You know, when it's this important, it's this important. And I actually support the intent. And I was going to ask the question: What it, if you grab what we're trying to achieve, which is that we feel um, not just quantity, but a certain quota of a type of housing needs to be encouraged? targeted within this what how would you deliver that that's the question i would i would come from a broad question first of all and want want um want you to show me how that can be incentivized there was all you, you've already mentioned auckland at the one end that did um price point there's um uh, percentage opportunities but there's also other ways because as i said i wondered why you removed the reference to you know giving a little favorable reference to some pro some types of project can that be another way to do it but i'm just asking procedurally do can it lie on the table while this gets sorted or not it can't yeah do, we do um, and it's so vital to get it right but yeah well you can move a procedural motion anytime you like that, that's your choice to test the room that's true but I'd, I'd rather do that with council being interested. I, if the rest of the council feel that we could make the decision today, fine. Well, you need to put it up, you need to get a seconder, and you need to test the room. What, um, sorry, Chair. What Lachlan suggested to us oh. wasn't to include in the policy this. Uh, initially, as I understand, was to just to acknowledge there's already a reference in the policy to, to hugs and the connection through to that, the ha Hamilton Urban Growth Strategy and to change, put something in there. That's how I understood what he was saying. So that you'd do it, it wouldn't be to include in the policy, that's not what he was putting. Yeah, sorry, I'm um, jumping over the table a little bit. But, but um, to, uh, we've already got, like you said, half a dozen applicants already, and I, I would doubt very much that any of them are the habitats or the likes who might, may take a little bit more time. Um, so very quickly the stock could go, so I just, trying to get, a, I guess, a little bit ahead of the queue and, and, and give a little bit of stronger language within the policy that of the intention. But, you know, if, if, if it's going to be more effective Dave, to put it in hugs, I'll, I'll, I'll seek your, your guidance. Sorry, I've completely drawn the meeting to a close, sorry. Well, we're trying to, we're trying to have a broadly wide open policy yeah. with the with the concept that every single application came back to this council for this council to consider whether it's in or out. Yep. And um, what, and that's our opportunity to enable applications of this sort and, and encourage and work with. But to be putting it into policy, we end up with perverse outcomes like what's happened in Auckland with Houses actually selling, being bulldozed immediately, and rebuilding with a with a um, far more expensive house on the same site. Yeah, which is why to, I was trying to, to head end to fulfil a restrictive policy. Yeah, which is why I was trying to head towards the you know, habitats and the likes who who don't have that sort of thing happen. That's because it was left in the hands of developers, 
So I'm trying to stick it over to, you know, put tranches of land, great word, um, over to those groups. So the whole concept was to have a really open policy so that mm. this, and with this council making every decision to enable or stop where we're heading. Yeah, and uh, we'll debate it later, but I'm suggesting that the whole concept is to increase affordability through supply. And I'm trying to just make sure that the kind of supply we supply is appropriate. <coughs> and we've seen from Auckland that if we just cut launch, put out its supply to developers, then tricks happen and it doesn't achieve its affordability. Luke? Um, so I'm not quite sure what you're asking me. Could I um, could I just maybe be helpful? I, I think yeah. I, I think we understand what we're trying to do. Um, you know, I'm not trying to be a counsellor this time. <laughs> um, so this is about the supply side of the debate around affordability, and then there are mm. other measures around. You know, the LVRs are part of this. The the restrict the bright line test and all those other things because. Supply is one factor of affordability, not the only factor. That's right, yeah. So this was, and, and, and the Mayor is exactly correct, and, and as is Councillor uh, Dave, in that the, the social housing providers or can still bring this forward, and if their provision is such that we believe it is a good idea, this group has, this group has the ability to give them more leeway against the operative plans than perhaps a scale of bigger that would be not affordable, because the idea is to provide supply. And, and, and that point then allows the social housing providers to provide as well as the developers to a market provision. That is why it would come back here to this table for that uh, recommendation on to the minister on that yep. basis. So it doesn't prohibit any of what you're after. Mm. Um, and and the, the, the perverse nature may be the unintended consequences by putting measures that then inhibit that within a policy may inhibit any developer saying, well, so example might be big SHA comes in, 1,000 homes, suddenly 20% is 200 homes somewhere else and then we, you know, we're getting buggered. Mm, mm. So uh, what we are seeing in Queenstown, um, just you asked about that before, yeah. is that, the, that they have a supply policy as we have here in the SHA, then they have an absolutely separate project, separate project outside of the supply argument, which is around the very things you could be talking right. about, which is a whole other... Uh, where the council own land and, and, and then they do lease, long term leases and a whole lot of other ideas. But they haven't tried to um, confuse the supply argument and the provision of faster supply, including that, with mm. a separate pro 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 uh, proposal around specific affordable housing. So, what projects. affordability measures have they put in? That was my original question. Yep. Yeah, so, what affordability in the SHAs, what yep. have they put in? So, that's why we've seen in Auckland the price point just hasn't yeah. worked. or uh, what we've seen in other areas where the developers agree, they sign up, they don't deliver that affordability area. Once the accord is finished, then they've still got the zoning. Right, yeah. So um, we, we want to protect the provision of supply across the whole. And remember, the intent was always about pockets of supply of land which would supplement the provision of Hamilton housing as a whole mm. whilst we go ahead and open up our next strategic land area, whether that be Peacocks or Protocar yeah. and Tilly, we're looking at Peacocks. The, yeah. I, I think um, when you look at all the factors that impact affordability, supply is only one. So it's not yeah. like bananas. When you eat a banana, that banana's gone. With a house you buy, it's still there. And we know, and, and the notes are in, in your report, that 70% of all home building is by Hamiltonians owning investment properties. Mm -hmm. So we need, you know, we, again, it's about supply and how do we increase that supply across more fronts. Yeah, and do yeah that. I get that. Okay. So right. I, I'm not trying to dampen what you're trying to achieve. I'm just mm. trying to ensure we don't inadvertently prevent a supply based program, i.e., what we have here, uh, by confusing it with a um, specific initiative to advance another cause, i.e., affordable homes for okay. in another space. Does that make, was that clear? Or was that just me? Yes, yes, it was. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Mark, do you want to stay with what you've got? <coughs> yeah, I'll, yeah I'll, I'll give it a lash. I don't think it's going to win, but I'll give it a lash, I think. Yeah. Okay. So we're heading into debate now. Yep. <coughs> yes, Anish. Oh, I'm still open if you want to go. Uh, no. Yep. 
okay. was in the middle of questions, then put up the yeah. motion, and then I, th uh, I thought other people might still have questions. Anyone that's fine? Okay. Um, Mayor Andrews, thank you. Paul, this is so this policy is about housing and supplying more land to the market to um, address the supply and demand issue, which at the moment is around the wrong way or has been in recent times to um, get more land onto the market. Uh, it's about um, being wide open to, for us as a council to be able to consider every offer that comes in and decide whether we're gonna go with it or not. And this is um, taking care of the shortage we have in the market over the next five years until we get our next growth cell open. And um, the wider that we can leave this open and this council, our, these you as elected members get to choose which applications are in and which applications we're gonna reject. And this is very different than anything else that has ever come before now. We, we've done, written in a, in a way where, where you're in control as elected members. And um, it, it's, it's a way of fast tracking and getting housing onto the market. Um, we've got to be really careful that we don't distort the market with, uh, with a motion with an amendment like this. And um, I believe that that will then put us in a position when we come, start getting through the process and more applications are coming in and nothing's coming in at an affordable level that we, the process won't stall because the wording mm. you've got there is um, target. But um, it, will, it will start to distort our decisions, like it could distort our decision later on. I believe that the, um, there is a group of, of trusts out there who have got together who are working on affordable housing and working specifically actually on social housing. And I think that that is where this should be, we should be targeting our energies with that group to bring social housing to the market through, that, through those charitable trusts. And as a council, we have tools that we can use at that stage to encourage social housing, which um, may be things like um, forgiving um, DCs or um, fee structures um, at, to, to enable those types of developments to go ahead. But I don't believe that doing it through this, um, this um, special housing area was ever the intention of, of the act in the first place. So, um, Councillor Bunting. Thank you. Um, yeah, you've had one of those dreams where you, you know everything's going well, and then all of a sudden you, your pants come off, and uh, you know, and, and you think, "Am I still awake?" I'm just going through that moment right now. Wake up. Very clumsy. Um, very clumsy. Uh, and thank you, Councillors, for your indulgence um, as we you know, we got through that in a reasonably ugly way. Look, the intention of, and hopefully this will make it clear, the intention of the special housing area is to enhance housing affordability by facilitating an increase in land and housing supply. Um, I believe the way we're looking at it with the uh, no holds barred way of going for it is we've actually turned around the intention. We're saying we want to increase land supply and hopefully enhance housing affordability. Um, there are three levers we've got to pull, and I thank the staff over the last couple of months for walking me through this. See, it strikes me that there are three levers we have here to affect affordability. One is supply and demand uh, on its own. The other one is the size of house or the size of dwelling or, or the density. And the other one is working along with a co-housing, social housing group like your Habitat for Humanity, Tai Nui, Salvation Army, uh, Diggy Bryant Trust, etc. Those three. So I'd like to just quickly address those three. Supply and demand, as we've seen with the previous um, uh, housing accords, comes with its massive landmines, like we've seen in Auckland. Um, we're asking developers to supply affordable housing, and I don't necessarily think we need to be putting them in charge of that. They're not desire, They're not there to specifically give affordable housing. We're asking them to do something that, by their very nature, they're not set up to do. The uh, house size um, 
lever. Well, quite simply, if I was a developer and I was building, I was requested to build a 20% of my stock small house or small size, I would build that last and um, wait for the price to go up. And then the small section is as expensive as a large section somewhere else. So you don't get affordability out of that. The only one that you can actually rely on is by working uh, effectively with co-housing groups like Habitat for Humanity, Salvation Army, Tainui if they're interested, etc. We will still grow. We will still grow. And for those of us who stood on growth, we will still grow. It's just we will grow in a more targeted area. It will not slow things down. As Mayor Andrew has said, there are groups out there already working at this, and I hope they come along. If this doesn't um, go through, I certainly hope we'll be having this sort of argument or debate every time it does happen, um, and I'll be supporting the original motion. But we have an opportunity to do something about affordability here. Um, as Calvin was talking before, he was talking about there are other ways of doing it, like we um, make some of our own land um, available for affordable housing. We don't have it. We sold it. It's gone. Um, this is a zoning issue. It won't cost us anything to do this. We don't have to buy the land and put it up as affordable housing. We just have to zone it. Um, to my mind, we're asking for 20% of special housing area to be put aside for special housing, for special housing. 80% of this is open slather for developers. It takes the heat off them to build affordable housing. And not only do they get 80% to do the development stuff in of this, they also get Peacock, they also get Rotatuna, they also get Ruakura, and any other piece of land that comes up that's not special housing. So all I'm really asking for is to send a clear signal um, that 20%, well, we make our, our target 20% to these um, these special uh, groups. And again, it's not, I just want to make the point, it's not 20% of each development that we would request to be a part of it. So, for example, if a group in the north of Hamilton came up, we wouldn't be saying 20% of it has to be affordable. We'd be saying 20% of our stock over the whole accord is targeted at affordable housing groups. And I re-emphasise the point, that leaves 80% for developers to do what they want to do with and Peacocks, and Rotatuna, and Rotokari, and Ruakura. All I'm asking for is 20% of the special housing accord we target uh, those special groups. So that's our one opportunity. Um, again, I apologise for the clumsiness of the whole procedure, but that's what I'm trying to, trying to get out. Councillor McPherson. I think Councillor Bunting's managed to hitch his pants at least halfway back up <laughs> with that speech. It was a good one. Uh, but... Uh, the, I still have a problem with the way the amendment's worded. I have no problem at all and totally support the intent of it. The way it's worded by putting a clause into the um, housing accord, I think, does uh, certainly give the perception, I think, possibly the reality of complicating it a little bit. And I think I totally, this is where I totally agree with the Mayor. We need to make it as simple, as straightforward as possible so there's as few barriers uh, real or apparent as possible. I want to see some work by council in the area of ensuring housing affordability, affordability and it might be higher than 20% done elsewhere in some of our documents and some of our work. I think it's something that any council in New Zealand nowadays, especially in the growth areas, ought to be paying attention to regardless of whether we have a housing accord or not, or special housing areas or not. I think it's becoming a major problem up in the north of the country, and we've got, you know, we're the second biggest city in, the, in that area, so we've got a major part that we could be playing in that. I don't trust the market to deliver exactly how we want. Um, I'm sorry to say that to you, Gary, but the market has proved to be untrustworthy in a number of these areas, not because it's trying to be untrustworthy, because it del it's got its own drivers and its own interests, and they're not the same interests as the wider community, in my opinion, especially on a thing like housing, where there's quite a lot of dollars involved, and it's, a, it's the, every family's biggest purchase ever, just about well, nearly every family's biggest purchase ever. So I think that we have to pay some attention when we're talking about our community in Hamilton to ensuring that uh, as many people as possible can have the ability to actually achieve that, that biggest purchase ever. At the moment, that's getting out of reach, certainly if you're in Auckland, and increasingly so down here. Um, I, I can't support the amendment because it, it's, 
it's complicating things and it's not necessary to do it that way. But what I would be calling for, and will, and you know, I'll support the motion for sure, is that staff report back to us on how that's going, give us the figures on a regular basis, which I know they were going to anyway, and there would have been no problem getting them, but actually, you know, focus in on, in on that. What, you know, what are we delivering each year or every, you know, every six months? What, what's the applications that we've approved going to deliver us overall? And if it's heading in slightly the wrong way or not, not high enough in the affordability stakes, we can take, we can bring in some more mechanisms to help. The mayor correctly outlined some of the mechanisms we can use on our way through. You know lower, the, you know, more remissions on D DCs, for instance, is, is one obvious one, but there's other things that can be done as well to make it a bit easier for social housing developments, for instance, to get off the mark. So I think that's the way we should handle this. Don't scare the horses, but make sure they head in the right direction. Thanks. Uh, Councillor Jeff. Thanks, Mayor Andrew. I'll be supporting the, uh, the motion um, although I do have every sympathy with what my uh, friend Councillor Bunting is trying to do. Uh, look, I, I thought our hearings uh, on the issues were extremely valuable. Uh, I was impressed with the submissions uh, and indeed I changed my views quite significantly based on what I heard. Uh, there was a theme that we were being too prescriptive coming through. Um, even though our motives were good and that we were trying to find ways to ensure more affordable housing, um, I think we just weren't doing it the same, the right way. Um, my view now is very much along the lines of option one, uh, which in essence supports a baseline approach. Um, I think uh, SHAs were created uh, to get new housing built in the city as quickly as possible, with a minimum of interference and a minimum of delays. Uh, supply is key, and, uh, and less is more uh, in this respect. Uh, I think option one gives uh, this council the opportunity, the clout to make a call on proposals. It keeps, thing, it keeps things simple. Uh, it's a tool I think we have to have if SHAs are going to fulfil the purpose for which they were intended. Uh, otherwise, we're muddying the water again, I believe, if we overcomplicate. Um, the SHA needs to be agile, uh, not an exercise in bureaucracy. I believe that was the intent of the Act and I support that. Um, there is, I, I believe now that some of the safeguards to ensure uh, affordability that we were looking at um, implementing, such as insisting that a certain percentage uh, uh, of sites were of a certain size, were just not going to work and were unrealistic, unrealistic. I don't want to place barriers in front of developers arbitrarily. Uh, the more provisos we place in this policy, the slower it will move. Um, there is nothing prohibiting social housing initiatives in the SHA policy now. Um, and I believe this council actually would, would welcome approaches and I think would enable such approaches. Um, so I do hope they come. But uh, I'm going to support the stripped back version uh, because I think it's the best way to get the job done. Thanks. Uh, Councillor Gary. <coughs> Thank you. I'll, um, I'll support the um, motion. Uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, it's less complex in um, the amendment. Uh, secondly, and there's an old saying that the the path to heaven is uh, the path to hell is paved with good intentions. Um, yeah. No hell. Yeah. Path to hell is paved with good intentions. Andrew will correct that for me. That's right, isn't it? It might even be a biblical thing. I don't know. Um, but uh, And that's exactly what Mark's falling into, that little trap. Um, <clears throat> and just sim very simply, if, if 400 um, or 200 properties have been built, none of them are um, uh, co-housing or whatever it is we're calling it now, affordable social, beg your pardon, everything stops. Nothing can go ahead. Now, you say a target, um, but to the extent you don't enforce that target, the target might as well not be there anyway. So <clears throat> here's the situation. 200 houses have been built. None of them fit the, uh, the qualification of affordable or social. Someone comes up with another housing accord uh, uh, suggestion. Um, we look at our target. No, we haven't hit our target. This is not going to hit the target. Sorry, you're stopping. And you need to understand that every house, even the biggest, most expensive, even... Dear old Mr Gallagher's beautiful mansion on the lake, to a certain extent, increased the supply of housing. 
now, and there's not that many people who can afford to buy that one, but someone down the chain, somewhere down the chain, their old house went onto the market, which was not the big multi-million dollar thing you see there. So every single house that is built, all other things being equal, will somewhat reduce the price of housing. So to the extent that um, that target, which is, I, I totally understand Mark, it's an unintended consequence, but it, the consequence of it will be that it will slow down supply. In that respect, it will um, uh, go uh, completely against what you want it to do. Uh, Councillor Sagi. Oh, well, yeah, I, I have to, of course, stay with um, Councillor Bunting, and I, 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 I'm happy to do that. Uh, and it's not—it's just it, intent. I think is um, I, I know it won't. It's not going to work or anything. I mean, we've long lost it. Uh, the, the, the possibility of having an affordable house in Hamilton. I mean, it is actually a joke, and I don't think it's going to happen with the SHA either. Um, uh, uh, you know, developers. A house in New Zealand is is not a, a home to live in for life. It, it's a commodity to trade for more money. It's never been something that, you know, we we've lived in long term. A few people have lived long term. Sorry, I shouldn't totally generalise that, but it has been something. Um, come on, every seven, five to seven years, um, we usually sell our house in today's market even faster. Hopefully that will change actually over time, but um, affordability is probably not, not there, but w we will create more, we, we need more houses and I get that, that we have to fast track that, absolutely. Um, people come into our wonderful city and that's awesome um, so if we can just have even the thought of if something comes on onto our table and it looks like more on the affordable social housing that we can fast track that that would be really easy, uh, awesome so we we've got the, like you said mayor andrew we have got that chance to to have a say whether this is going to be we want to have that push through um yeah uh, maybe faster than others, um, if need be, and um, hopefully we'll, we'll get something for people that, uh, for, uh, for our young children to get into houses. I, I just find it very hard to see even, but um, I'm looking forward to hopefully um, that this will change a little bit, yeah, the game and we, we can have some affordable housing, but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll wait and see. Thank you. Okay, so... In Hamilton, you still can buy a house on a titled section for $350,000. It might be a half section, but it's still its own titled section, an unattached house. But I do hear what you're saying, Mark, and there is a group in town who's starting to work on social housing, and I will personally get involved with that group and do what I can as council um, supporting in that direction um, for doing, make, ensuring that council's doing all we can to enable social housing <coughs> providers to do the best that they can for the city. And I believe that there is room for our council to do that. And um, I think it's probably appropriate for me as the mayor to get involved with that group and, and um, ensure that we're not holding back um, those types of developments um, in any way. So I'll, I'll give my word that I'll, I'll get involved in that. And um, so I do hear your heart, Mark, where you're trying to go and I, I think, um, we we do need to go there for our, our vulnerable and those at the bottom, and we need to get people into into housing. It's 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 a very very important place where people need to own their own home and be permanent. And I think so. All right. So shall we go to the vote? So we're voting first on the amendment. The amendment is lost. Three, four, seven against. Shh, no talking, no talking till after the vote. motion is carried unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Thank you, Lachlan. Oh, yeah. Shall we just um, back at, court, uh, ten, at five past? Thanks, guys.
Page 130. Um, item 13. Thank you, Mayor Andrew. Uh, I believe the Chair of the Finance Strategy and Revenue Task Force wants to say a few words first. Thank you, Chair. 11 first. That's why I'm just on uh, the wrong page. OK, uh, yes, I'd, I'd just like to report, report back as Chair of the uh, Financial Strategy and Revenue Task Force. Um, I, I understand everyone will have read it, but I just want to very quickly uh, cover the purpose of the of the um, task force and and what we've and, and and where we've landed. The task force was established following the council meeting on the 7th of March, 2017, and its terms of reference mainly covered reviewing and recommending as appropriate changes to the financial strategy of council. That was this was set in 2012, and it was reaffirmed by the last council in 2014. And the second area was considering revenue options to recommend to the Mayor for presentation to elected members for the LTP considerations in 2017 and 18. The task force solely uh, focused on revenue, but it did consider to a lesser extent the impact of depreciation on the financial strategy, in particular around balancing the books and, and, and this new idea of living or this new concept of living within our means. The outcomes have been 
that we have and we are recommending today some amendments to the financial strategy uh, following on from the PwC report and a range of possible revenue options, including new targeted rates for the Mayor to lead through on Council's formulation of the long-term district plan. These are recommendations um, only, but with, approv with approval today, it will allow uh, management to work on modelling the impact of these on future incomes. Um, depreciation remains, in my view, the elephant in the room. There are risks, there's confusion, and there's major costs uh, that, that, challenge, that present challenges for us to face. The annual depreciation charge is now more than $7 million more per year than it was in 2012, and the annual change will increase significantly over the next few years. I'll leave comments on this for the debate, but I believe that there is still work to be done in understanding depreciation, both within this organisation and around this table. Um, but I believe that apart from the depreciation area, the work of the task force is now complete um, so, uh, with this recommendation today. And um, on behalf of the task force, I'll give thanks to David and his team for the extensive work that they've done on this. Also to Stephen and Dave, who were the external experts who came in to assist us with this. So when we're ready, Chair, I'm happy to move the recommendation. Thank you. Um, so we'll take the motion as as moved by um, Rob, and I'll uh, I'll second the motion. So. Um, but there may still be some questions. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, Councillor Mallet. Thanks, Andrew. Um, and this is to Andrew. I guess to Rob. Or, um, no questions. Over okay. Right, please. So page one hundred and thirty. <laughs> <laughs> Spineless bloody wimp. <laughs> uh, C, just just the wording of that. So just to be quite clear, so this and I was on the strategy task. So I, but I just I haven't seen. I, this is the first time I'd seen the actual um, recommendations. That is just saying that um, all of this work, these recommendations, these these measurements, blah blah blah, and potential are going to be considered during the ten year plan. It's not. Be that this uh, us approving this won't adopt them for the ten-year plan, will it? That is absolutely yeah, correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Taylor. Thank you, Mayor Andrew. Um, there was there's been a little bit of discussion, and I think it was mentioned at the briefing recently on this about um, the possibility of geographical targeted rates a couple of times in, in debate, or well not in debate, discussion, Rotatuna has come up along those lines. The, I don't see any reference to that here. Is that, is that something that's been, or was not considered part of the um, task forces? That would uh, be part of the modelling. That would be part of the modelling that we would go away if council approves the recommendations to continue on modelling these options. But it's not explicitly stated in any of the options under C, 3C, I see. Um, it's, it's not, it's a variable around a targeted rate, just like there are a number of variables that we didn't disclose. Um, there are too many to disclose, but there are different ways we can set targeted rates. So, um, okay. so we, will, we will model all those different ways and okay. come back to council with options so that you can review and consider. Great, okay. The, in terms of the targeted rate for community infrastructure, um, <clears throat> I presume, is, will the work that you do on that be, um, looking at breaking things out, such as Hamilton Gardens, et cetera? Or, uh, I ask that because I suppose um, I'm a little concerned about um, an overarching community infrastructure targeted rate rather than a targeted rate for, say, Hamilton Gardens or River Plan or something like that, just because I think they're more transparent than just saying community. Sure, and that transparency is important. So we'll, we'll be modelling both <coughs> scenarios for consideration. Both? Um, a, a, a flat targeted rate to build um, a, a pool of money, if you like, to be invested in community infrastructure, as well as examples of if you took a specific community piece of community infrastructure, um, what would that look like if we just if we just um, took that option? Great, thank thank you. One last one was um, the briefing the other day went by in a bit of a blur. It was all very quick. 
as some of them are these days. Um, and there was a, the, the option C1 moving to full capital value uh, rating sooner came up. Yes. Um, th can someone just clarify <coughs> for me, that's intended to pick up the new people, but the new um, people building, et cetera. Does that have any impact on existing ratepayers? It will have, uh, it is aimed at matching growth, paying for growth. So yep. it, uh, th that initiative is, is targeted at ensuring all new um, house, houses or, or households um, pay um, at a full capital value rate based on that property's value. Um, the, uh, the existing rates um, for existing rate payers will still move at that 3.8% uh, currently. Um, with the decision that we've made at 3.8%. Um, of course, that could change as we go through the 10-year plan, but the actual who within existing ratepayers pays what is what we would be modelling. So there could be, as you know, there's a 10-year transition and yep. we're into year three. Yep. So if we moved um, if we moved to year 10 straight away and, and, and uh, calculated our, tar our rates on capital value immediately, that would mean that those with higher valued properties would would pay more, and those with lower valued properties would pay less. But that is a, um, a generalisation because you will, of course, capital value includes the value of the house and the land. So if we had a large house on a small piece of land, as opposed to a small house on a large piece of land, yep. um, there will be movements between those two. And so we can't be definitive, but um, doing, doing further modelling will allow us to be able to give you the, um, information around the impact of that. So just so I get it right in my head then, so so s someone who's been told that it's going to be phased in over 10 years <coughs> to capital value, yes. um, it, if this goes through, it, it could be five years, say, or something like that, four or five years. So they, it would be phased. I, yeah, yeah, that's right. So so it could be phased in completely in another one or two years. Yeah, and I, I think it's really important to add that we uh, council <coughs> currently has a remissions policy that we apply to those um, those ratepayers that uh, are struggling to pay their rates. And what we could do if we were to move, for example, straight away to capital value is we could uh, redefine the remissions policy to um, target those top uh, ratepayers um, some sort of spread over the next few years to ease that pain. But sure. um, I think the important thing to um, recognise here is that Council has already made a, a decision to move to 100% capital value rating. Um, the question is whether we just do it sooner or yeah. not. Yeah, I wasn't, um, I was really just make, just making sure, sure. I got it straight in my head. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor Gallagher. So, so if we take the current gardens, um, and that's a household flat rate, a couple of twenty ten dollars, right? And you have that option, and that you see that that's irrespective. Uh, you could presumably, as tools, have a Hamilton Gardens and River plan rate for twenty dollars. That would be one. It could be an option. Yeah, or it could be a Hamilton Gardens and River rate, but based on the capital value, which means that uh, someone who is in a fairly wealthy property get, might get a bit of a shock as to what they were contributing towards that. They would, it's an interesting issue. Uh, there is a phil philosophical issue there, yeah, but that, that, that issue. would be correct. Uh, so that's that's an option, whether it's just a straight uh, quantum for, across the board as a unique thing. The sure, and it's important, to, it's important to know that doing that further work is to bring back information for you to be able to make that decision. Yeah. So no decisions have been made yeah, at this point. I'll, also, I think as we move to capital value, uh, there's going to be debates around what I'd call the mansion tax, so that where a capital value rating loses all relativity to the value of goods, services and enjoyment of, it, of civic amenities relative to the rate that someone pays. And that's an interesting issue as we, you know, that's one, the only downside in my view of capital value. Um, the other thing is if, say, we'd say peacocks, uh, you talk about a targeted rate, so you can actually, a targeted rate can obviously just, sorry to repeat this, geographic, so, for example, we could contemplate down the track that if there was a swimming pool proposal and gymnasium proposal for a peacock's growth cell, <coughs> there's a point at which there would be a peacock's targeted rate that is based possible. on a specific geographic facility. Correct. Is that right? Um, and also, um, targeted rate, could you just explain targeted rate on developer ready land? Is that is that hammering the green, so as soon as the land comes from a greenfields, 
So that would be land that we've already invested in um, leading infrastructure, so right. it's ready there to be developed. And so um, th that example of which we'd like to option um, model more would be about um, recognising that council uh, invests a lot of money and time and effort in terms of bringing those um, developer ready land parcels um, to the market ready for development but there is only so far council can go so um, we obviously need developers to uh, make the decision to develop their land and so to uh, if we were to impose a, a um, developer ready targeted rate on those developers for example if we were able to if we if we decided to double their rates that would be a disincentive for them to hold on to that land uh, potentially uh, and but it also would match um, some of our uh, guiding financial principles uh, about right. growth so, paying for growth. So basically it's an incentive for them to not just have it as a land bank. Correct. Float around. It is a percentage for them to develop and put it, uh, you know, straight That's into correct. the pool. That's um, correct. Yes, and, um, no, that, 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 that's fine. And, um, yeah, I think, I think that's my... We will come back with options. Um, yeah, if, and if and then is... the other thing is... Uh, Removing the CBD remissions, the contribution policy. Yes. Uh, one would argue that if we have a clear timeline, you know, when that's going to happen, this is not like the Rob Muldoon, we're going to put the gas up at midnight tonight on the night of budget shock horror announcement. It's going to be sort of, this is going to happen within a, in a year. So you've got, and that's as long as you've got your plans in and you've got your consents then there is yep, a, a yep, transition okay. period so people yep. who are ready to go can actually yeah, so operate on a, on a, on a, a, an existing assumption but if people were just going to keep it for five years as a land bank, no. That's years. right. Mm. Just bear in mind, um, this with um, Councillor Pascoe has talked about the Financial Strategy and Revenue Task Force having done its job. Mm. So what we're, what we're now proposing is those options be brought through to the um, standard 10-year plan process so in terms of revenue options um, and and at the end of this when we get to a draft that council's happy with there will be a requirement to consult with the community of course and so they'll have their opportunity to um, uh, to work through what we're proposing. And the other question because not being a member of the task force but I did hear in the task force you or councillor Rob can ask what the, the, the one of the key reasons for moving to capital value sooner can you just repeat that because I think sure, that's quite a good. It's, sure it's um, it's to capture the um, uh, the new housing to pay the um, the, the rates on 100% of capital values, which means there's a revenue uplift for the city, and it more more aligns growth paying for growth, because council will have paid for lead infrastructure into that new uh, div subdivision, and um, and what we're saying is that if you move to capital, the sooner you move to capital value in terms of basing rates for those new houses, um, you, uh, council will will. Uh, uh, get a revenue return that's higher than the, the waiting for the next seven years to get through the transformation and the uh, transition thing, rather. The crucial thing obviously it's not it's just a redistribution of rates but what you're saying with that model is that you're applying rates where the money is being spent in Correct. development. Correct. Mm. Thank you. Councillor Mallet. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> just uh, one uh, uh, thing that I think is missing from the report is definitions of the um, metrics, you know, the balance in the books and things like that? That's it, it right. And and the, pu the purpose for that is that as we work create through... Create confusion. And, <laughs> as, to, um, as we work through the options and uh, council make a decision on um, how each option would impact on the financial strategy, yeah. then we would be able to put those put that, that phraseology together, if you like, including limits. OK, this... but. Okay, we've got that the recommendation is that the council approves the following working uh, working financial strategy measures, debt to revenue. Now it says LGFA calculation and balancing the book, new calculation. That to me is uh, particularly something like a new calculation is spectacularly unhelpful to a councillor who doesn't know what that means. No, um, so the LGFA is outlined in the LGFA um uh, documentation, and we went through that in the task force, of course. That's and right, but it's not. But it's not in this report. No, it's not. Yeah. So, but if we're will, going to make a recommendation that, here, that will be spent out. And um, okay, well, and just it, we just need to be very clear what we mean. I mean, yep. you and I know, and Rob will know, yep. and some people might know, but there'll be a lot of people who won't know what those mean. 
Do you think that... And because I've just got the definition... Well, you know, I've got... In terms of balancing the books, you go... F there's a swing of about $24 million between the Hamilton City Council one and the what we call the PWC one, which I think is what you're calling here new calculation. Is that right? So if we, if we refer you, Councillor Mallet, to um, paragraph 33, um, we put some information in there to steer readers of the report yep. in terms of what we mean. And I've written beside that, please define properly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's my note. Sure. OK, so, yeah, it just... It just you know, it's, just, it's a common thing that we don't we don't give objective, really clear definitions of things. And if you don't do that, sure. you know, Ziggy and I will have quite different uh, impressions about what the thing is. We will be capturing mm -hmm. um, specifically those definitions um, in the final uh, revenue and finance policy, which okay. will um, and they will articulate specifically what those definition, okay. definitions are. Okay. Well, what what's this recommendation to do then? So the first is to. Um, highlight that we have reviewed all the different ways we could measure the financial strategy. And but this, sorry, sorry, David, to interrupt you there. Um, paragraph three, that the council approves the following financial um, measures, strategy measures. Yes. That's actually approving it, as opposed to the other one we, uh, which, which I asked was about for consideration at the 10-year plan. But we're actually approving something there which I don't think is adequately defined. So, so um, that's why we put the word working in there. So um, those first Sorry, four... Sorry, where's working? Oh, working. So, so it approves the following working financial strategy measures with the purpose of um, them not becoming final until we've articulated um, what you're talking about in terms of okay. the exact measurement and how that, okay. how that reflects in our financial strategy. So will there be another recommendation coming to Council which will have those As precise part of the ten -year plan process, definitions yes. in it? Yes. OK, thank you. <coughs> Okay, so we'll move to debate. Um, can I ask you a question, somebody? Um, <laughs> um, we've got introducing a targeted rate to fund community infrastructure. We also do have um, major transport issues, and um, and there is a possibility we um, during a ten-year plan process um, I might like to introduce a targeted rate for for roading, for roading projects. Could transport, yeah, and um, could we just add that into the list um, now before? Um, if if I have Rob's permission, because we've already moved it. Um, just so that staff are in the bottom list where you're coming back with detailed modelling. Um, so obviously we're not locking anything in here, guys, but it's just an area where I know it's, um, um, we've under-invested for a long time and, and it's an area that we'd like to look at as well, um, leading into the 10-year plan. Um, well, Rob, is that, is that OK well, with you? I, mean, I, I, I originally saw C as the starting point of where we landed from the task force, but I didn't see that as necessary. this is my view, didn't see it necessarily precluding um, other revenue options that might pop out, because it is possible that some of these may be, um, um, may be ideal to, to, um, to introduce, but may not yield sufficient revenue to make it cost effective to do so. Mm. Um, so look, I'm I'm relaxed about whether it gets extended further. These are these are the ones that we kind of landed on, yeah. and felt that there was uh, interest from the task force as well as the member briefing that we had last week. That I, I thought the member briefing last week specifically talked about the transport um, targeted rates. No. Okay. Look, I, look, I am relaxed yeah. about what goes in there. It's just really a matter of trying to yeah. funnel yeah. in, given that staff resources are, are are not infinite are not finite that we that we need to um, that we need to um, probably put a stake in the ground somewhere but look I'm relaxed about adding that in if that's if that's preferred okay well, I think um, as, a, as a as another option mayor Andrew we're currently supporting you to lead the 10-year plan in your budget and there'll be a number yeah. of different modeling that we'll be doing for you in addition <laughs> to mm. the the modeling that's done, been done here so mm. not so um, not including the transport um, targeted rate on here wouldn't preclude us modelling that for you. Yeah, but is, is, is the members comfortable with me adding that in, that being added in? If anyone's not, I'll, I won't 
go there today, but if, if everyone's comfortable, just just looking at the modelling around it. So yeah, look, I, I'm I'm happy uh, given okay. I moved it. I'm happy for it to be added. Okay, there. thank you. Yeah. Could you just um, uh, come up with some wording there? Um, it's already up there. You comfortable with that wording? Yes. But I, I do, do make the point though that I'm not intending that to be the limited yeah. number of options that might be available as as um, as David has pointed out, you know, there may well be some options that we might consider after, or you might consider after looking at what perhaps other councils are doing around the country because uh, this revenue issue, and I've got here, a, which I'll introduce in the debate, this one from Auckland, uh, where they have got some significant challenges. Um. All right. Okay, David, are you happy with that wording um, being your department, your area? Yep. All right. Yeah, but yeah. Well, Chris, Chris, are you happy with that wording? Yep. Yeah. All right. Okay, so we'll move to debate. Um, uh, Rob. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Look, I think the study was intended to bring uh, financial reality to the council table, and I think it will bring, uh, once the work has been done, some pretty important and useful data that will assist the whole of the council in the long-term plan discussions. I think we've found, and certainly it was discussed this morning, how easy it is to find uh, little areas of um, spends that, that aid our community and that we personally think are important in terms of uh, where we think we can add value uh, back to our communities. But those spends, even if they're relatively small, do add up. And um, my very quick calculation of what we've already given away uh, in the nine months and the staff requests are around about three and a half million. And then, of course, this morning we um, considered indoor courts. Uh, retaining the Founders Theatre, um, a new regional theatre, and all of these translate into grants or, and, or, and or OPEX, and they add to the costs which will impact on the definition of day-to-day -day running of the city because they will be costs in the year in which we spend them. So they will impact on our bottom line. So the reality is that these lost amounts need to be replaced and there are limits to the places where we can derive those funds from. Um, Ernst & Young uh, did a report for the Auckland Council last year, and they identified three main areas um, of, of, uh, of uh, revenue that will help councils fund. And I'm, I'm, I'm bringing this up again because of the article, and I'll talk about that in yesterday's uh, New Zealand Herald. But they identified the three areas of, as sale of assets, borrowing or increasing rates and fees. Uh, and th this, uh, and of course we don't have a lot of assets, we don't have shares in Ports of Auckland or shares in um, uh, Auckland Airport, which Auckland does, that could give them significant amounts, millions and millions of dollars that will allow them to go for that. So our two main areas of funding our revenue will come from borrowing and or increasing rates and fees. And that reality check is important because in this article, was, which was in yesterday's New Zealand Herald, uh, the new mayor there, uh, Mr Goff, mentioned that while he had a promise of, limit, of, set of limiting rates at 2.5%, the financial reality as they move into their long-term plan is that in order to fund the costs of running the city will mean an increase in rates of between 16 and 27%. Now, I don't know how he's got those figures, but certainly that's what's been reported in here. And this is the same kind of issues that we are facing here. Um, and so we need to be, um, we need to show some courage around um, how we're going to go about funding what we've already spent and what we propose to spend in terms of how we formulate the long-term plan. I mentioned about depreciation in the, in, in the Chair's report and about the fact that it had gone up by $7 million a year, more than what it was in 2012. And when we talk about a hole in our day-to-day -day running, depreciation is the major single line item that is contributing to that hole that we have. Um, last year, that cost was around $61.5 million in our financial statements, and it will grow significantly over the next few years. I've dug out a couple of examples just to show how one single item will add to that. The Rotatuna Reservoir 
if, it, if we treat it as a 100-year asset, and, and Chris might, um, might have a different view on this, it will alone increase depreciation by at least $280,000 a year, and that's just one asset, one new asset in the city. Peacock, if it goes ahead, and I don't know how much of the $273 million spend will be for land, which of course we don't depreciate, but it could add up to $3 million a year once Peacock is up and running uh, onto our depreciation bill. Um, so if we are going to maintain living in our means, rates, rates and or borrowing will need to increase, not only to cover the existing hole that Mayor Andrew describes, but also these rising costs. And you know, it's unlikely that we will collect $3 million more in rates from Peacock for a long, long time. I did a very quick calculation, and if we used our average of 2170, which is the average residential rates we collect, that would mean we would need to have 1,390 new ratepayer sections in Peacock just to cover the depreciation. I'll move. And that doesn't allow for we considering. To Mark, thank you. Sorry, keep, that keep doesn't going. allow for considering the OPEX costs, the increased OPEX costs that would be associated with those new properties. So now that this work is completed, I suggest greater courage will be needed by those councillors who opposed a rate increase back in March. And I think if you don't feel confident uh, with the outcome of this report, then you need the out outcome of this task force, then I think you need to consider voting against this recommendation. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Gallagher. Yes, thank you for that uh, presentation and thank you to the Chair and the Task Force for your very good work in terms of uh, developing discussions around the whole range of tools in the toolbox we have to have uh, to fund a very rapidly uh, growing city. And I think the reference to Auckland was relevant in that they have huge pressures, but so do other major communities like Tauranga, the high growth areas, Queenstown, Christchurch, Wellington, etc. I think one of the things that I will continue to um, focus on is I think, uh, and Lance will know this off by heart, uh, I think geographically we are the about the third or fourth smallest local authority in New Zealand, is that right? Third, second, third. Second, or third. second or third. I think Kaurau is smaller than us. And I think Napier may be smaller than us. And the, the key, the big elephant in the room has always been simply this, that you have a limited pool of ratepayers who are having to provide uh, facilities for a sub-regional city. And I know I go on and on about this, but I think it's an issue that we have to continue to talk about and talk loudly about when we talk about regional funding. And the example that you're going to witness on Monday when the Mayor and the Prime Minister opened the Rotatuna Stadium, and that was a very good partnership between taxpayer and ratepayer. So that's, a, you know, talking about the toolbox, really what are other opportunities to work with the, the taxpayer, which is ourselves. Uh, but just behind the school, you only have to walk, I'm not sure how many hundred metres behind that school, and there's a whole swack of ratepayers who are paying zero. So if you're in front of the school, you pay the full whack. You only have to walk about 100 metres, 200 metres, and you pay nothing. And so if you live, say, around on the other side of Lake Rotokauri, near the zoo, if you live uh, in the Tamahiri area, all your interactions, 100% of your interactions, are with the city of Hamilton. You come here to work, your kids go to school here, you go to university here, you use the Hamilton Gardens, you use the swimming pools, you use the parks, gardens, um, you drive over all the local roads and use the footpaths. But you're on a freebie. You're on a freebie. And I'm just going to say in terms of our moving forward, this city is not in the long term going to be able to sustain a chunk of its residents not paying a bean. Because the reality is... Uh, the, I think there's a point where we will go to the Local Government Commission down the track and we will talk with our neighbours to say we do need to refine 
uh, our boundaries because basically we do have uh, a subset of what I call Hamiltonians who are not paying anything. And in this area, we have to look at ways. Now, it may be that the last chance saloon, as Councillor Taylor has talked about, <coughs> it may be that we'll get a regional funding, sub-regional funding mechanism, which means we also pay for the Raglan Surf Life Saving Club because our kids go to the beach there. I get that. But it seems to me, in terms of this revenue task force role, that we've got to be very inc come, become increasingly assertive uh, about all these things we have to fund, and yet we have a whole swack of Hamilton residents who are not paying anything at this point. And I do think, with respect, there's a crunch time for us, particularly during our LTP discussions, where we have to address that. This city is providing a swack of facilities uh, across a sub-region, which I don't believe, res with respect, the rest of the sub-region is um, picking up adequately. But finally, thank you very much. I think this is a very worthwhile exercise. And I think it's a worthwhile exercise in terms of even a geographic targeted rate, uh, the question of capital value. In other words, if you move into an area such as Peacocks, and suddenly there's a, a swimming pool just down the road, which you know is a neighbourhood facility, is to what degree do those areas pay a bit more than, say, someone in another part of town? And in the end, you will never get a perfect answer. In the end, you will never get a totally fair answer. Uh, you know, these are quite still uh, blunt instruments. Uh, I still pine for the day when a progressive government uh, gives us back our GST on rates, but that's another story and maybe he is, he is hoping. But I do know that in, in local government, one is very enthusiastic about that. Once you come anywhere near central government, your enthusiasm suddenly disappears. My enthusiasm is back. My enthusiasm is now back for that. But uh, again, thank you to the task force for the excellent work you've done. Councillor Mallet. Uh, thank you, and I was on the task force, but I do want to thank Rob for his leadership and the support we got from the staff. It was a, 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 a very um, educational process. Um, the criticisms, criticism I have of the task force that it was only ever directed to one side of the equation. <clears throat> it was only ever directed at the revenue side of the equation. Um, and that's cool, that was, you know, but I tell you what, it, it's, there is no task force currently working on the other side of the equation. That task force, such that it is, is the elected membership here, the 13 <coughs> people around this table. So we are the guys who are going to have to try and figure out, um, can we mitigate the rate increases? Can we uh, reduce the plunder of our ratepayers? Um, we have to address our spending. And I know I'm a broken record, but just this morning was very, well, it wasn't enlightening to me because I've seen it all before, but to be honest, it was like a bunch of kids picking lollies out of, a, out of the supermarket and they knew no one was watching them. Um, you know, people, you know we, we're talking about the, um, what is it called, the regional theatre, which in the space of three months, I think, has gone up by 50%. I, I remember it being 50 million, and it was now $72 million. Um, so we, we, no one seemed to blanch when that went up to $72 million. And then some, then people started jumping in and say, and we'll keep founders as well, because, you know, it's founders, and um, it's sure it's broken and that sort of stuff, but we'll keep it. Who cares? And um, I, I say with all genuine, genuineness, if that's a word, um, we need to harden up. Uh, because, and we need to be able to say no to people, and we need to say um, we are here to protect and serve the ratepayers and residents, residents of this city. To some extent, that involves providing um, the core facilities that you're required, but to some extent, it, it, it involves protecting their incomes such that they can afford to stay in their houses, they can afford to pay the rent, they can afford to pay their power bills. Um, so. Um, as I said, uh, uh, this, is the, this is one side of the equation. It's an important side of the equation. It is a bit disappointing, I think, and I'm sorry, this is, this is not a criticism, but I think we need to be cautious of calling something a targeted rate and then suddenly think it's not rates. It's called, the second word in that phrase is rates. Okay, it might be targeted like the gardens one, was, but that was a targeted rate that hit every single rate payer. Um, all, you know, they all got the same amount. Um, some of these might be, some of these targeted rates uh, will appear to be 
somewhat close to user pays, and that's the extent that they're geographical, I suppose, that you know, if we do a rate for Rotatuna's um, parks and pools and things like that, that is kind of user pays, but it's not user pays. Um, we do need to start, I think, moving our funding away from rating people just because they live here to, rate, to charging for using our facilities. Now, that's a hard thing to do, because what it does, it confirms well, it, it puts all of our services to the test of do people actually want to pay for them? You know, you can have this challenge when you go to the library, when you go to the museum, when you go to a lot of things. Um, libraries are great to go to when they're free, but if you then have to, if you put a user charge on a library and make people pay the cost, suddenly the customer, who is the ratepayer, suddenly has to see, am I getting good value for this? And if they're not getting good value, they won't come back. Um, and I brought the library up <coughs> for obvious reasons because it's, um, you know, I think it's one of those things that over time, perhaps it's not today, but over time the bricks and mortar library, I think, um, are becoming obsolete, uh, not fit for purpose. And um, I think is one of those things where we can start, and it, you know, Rob talked about depreciation. One of, one of the only ways we can, we can reduce our depreciation charges, and I know he wasn't talking about reducing depreciation, he was just explaining the huge increases that were coming down the road with all the facilities we're, we're looking to spend by. But one of the ways we can reduce depreciation, which is a huge part of our expenditure, is by being honest about the assets that we are, that we are maintaining and depreciating and thinking, are we really getting good value for our community? Um, and I think there are some of those things, if you take a really, really objective, clear-eyed view, you would have to say, no, they're not providing quality. Um, they're not providing good value for money for our, for our community. Okay. Um, but anyway, so uh, I think the purpose of the uh, task force was good. Purpose was good, and the outcome has been good. But it's totally unbalanced. That's all. I'm not. I'm not criticising this for what's there. I'm not criticising it for what's not there because it wasn't asked to do that. But just be aware, there's a whole. There's the other side of the story, which is on the other bit of the paper, which is how do we address our expenditure? Thank you. Councillor McPherson. Oh, look, just, just briefly, because I don't want to compete with three great speeches. In fact, Martin's was so good that I'm going to ask for a recording of it and send it to everyone who was in Parliament in the late 1980s when they brought in GST to, and put it on. This is what he meant to say. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> but I do think one thing, well, lots of things in what he said were good, but one thing in particular, the, uh, he mentioned all the suburbs around the outskirts of Hamilton that are not in Hamilton that have uh, take, get an advantage from our facilities and don't pay a red cent. And maybe, this is thinking outside the square, we should be including a look at, it, uh, at a ta Waikato district um, requiring a targeted rate on every, every property within 10 kilometres of Hamilton. Um, and, and that may sound silly and far-fetched, but the, for the reasons that Martin outlines, it would actually be fair uh, if you pitch it right and then target it towards the right facilities. And I note, if, if we're thinking it's all one way, or they're saying it's all one way, that for 10 years, Fonterra's rates, even after it came into the city, were paid to Waikato District Council, not to Hamilton. Um, so don't don't forget that, guys. You know, it's it's not like this sort of thing hasn't been done before. So that I don't know how we. I'm not trying to get that inserted in as the list here, but I think we seriously have to do some work on that. I mean, every time we have a new piece of infrastructure, social infrastructure especially, provided like the Rotuna um, Recreation Centre out there, we suddenly remember that we should be getting some money from Waikato District, and they suddenly remember that they haven't included any thoughts about it in any of their plans, so they, they say, no, we can't do it this year or this 10 years or something like that. We don't actually, in a strategic way, raise that point anywhere near enough or that issue anywhere near enough. If we don't start doing that, we might as well expand at least to the Huckery Mata Hills and Topuri and um, Ohaupo and the airport and the whole lot if, we, if we're not going to get that support from the, those people. So Jeff would end up in Waikato, in Hamilton City, where you are. <laughs> So, Speak for yourself. so you no, no, I, no, no, I'm, I'm 12 kilometres out. That's why I picked 10. <laughs> no, I'm, 
that we're serious. We need to do something in that area strategically. Start talking about that. Rota Kauri School, exactly right. Catchment of properties overlooks the the nice green zoo we supply. You know what's their amenity? It's all supplied by Hamilton. Thanks. Um, I just want to thank um, staff who are involved in this, Stephen and David and others. And I know um, it's been a lot of work there. Um, thank the task force for what you did. Um, and yes, this was looking at revenue. It wasn't looking at um, other things. It was the financial strategy and revenues task force. And um, thank you, Rob, for leading this and for your professional way that you did it and professional way you presented today. So just thank all those concerned. This is a big step forward into the 10-year plan, um, a big step forward, actually. Mm -hmm. And um, it's given staff direction now of, of what areas to focus on. So made into the room four months ago, six months ago. <laughs> That's what started it off. Yeah. So um, yeah. So it's a it's a team thing here that we've, we're all going to be a part of, and we're all going to be a majority of us will approve this in the end, and um, it's not going to be easy for any of us. And um, it's just um, this is setting really the parameters for where we're heading um, largely, and um, it's just the process. I think it's um, just a really big step forward today in the process of setting direction of, of where we may well end up. So thanks very much. So we'll go to the votes. All those for, any against, carried unanimously. Thank you. OK, so we just go straight to item 14 now. Yeah, we have. Yeah. Okay, David, um, should we take the reporter's read? Yes, please. Okay, um, someone to move the staff recommendation. Thank you, James. Seconded by uh, Leo. There's no one, no questions, no debates. So, um, all those for? Any against? Carried. Thank you. Item, now we'll go back to item 11. Uh, Ricky, welcome. I love your tie. How did you know what colour to wear? <laughs> yeah, he's a bit of a clue. <laughs> okay, so shall we take the reporter's red? Um, do you want to introduce that at all, Ricky, or are you comfortable with? Yeah, I'll, I'll just I'll give a quick run through. Yep. Um, so, uh, legislation requires uh, or councils to have a significance and engagement policy uh, and that's because it guides council uh, staff and the community about uh, the degree of significance for proposals and decisions and uh, when and how the community uh, can be expected to be engaged uh, the significance and engagement policies applied in two steps uh, first significance is determined and then um, if engagement is determined as necessary, the level as well as the approach is the second step in the process. Uh, the existing policy was scheduled for review this year and the aim of the review uh, for staff was to provide more clarity and therefore uh, enable efficiency in terms of that two-step application. Uh, in an effort to achieve this, uh, the proposed uh, draft policy reflects uh, fle feedback from staff that use it around the organisation, uh, a combination of elements from other policies around the country, uh, guidance from uh, Solgum, which is, if you, if you don't know what Solgum is, the, um, a national society that promotes uh, and supports professional management in local government, uh, input from elected members coming out of the July uh, elected member briefing and uh, compliance with, with legal requirements. So it's essentially the council has uh, two options to consider. Uh, the council can adopt the policy as attached if it feels that on reasonable grounds it has uh, sufficient information 
on the community interests and preferences uh, to enable the purpose of the policy to be achieved. Uh, and you can refer to paragraphs uh, 32 and 38 for that option. Or the council uh, must consult on the policy if it feels that on reasonable grounds it does not have sufficient information on the community interests and preferences uh, to enable the purpose of the policy to be achieved. And those are uh, paragraphs 39 to 43. Uh, happy to take questions. Councillor Rob. Recommendation from the city solicitor as to which of the two policies he suggests, and or have you a po have you a recommendation to us as to whether we should consult or not? Uh, no. So, so the the recommendation I suppose is as per paragraph two, uh, which suggests that if uh, council feel that they uh, comply with uh, the legislation around. Um, okay. Okay, so yep. it's so it's or you haven't not really suggesting to us which one of those two you think after taking legal advice is the preferred option. That's correct. So okay. um, the legal advice around this was essentially that uh, it would be council that would be the only ones that would be who, able who to. Could make, who could that's make. correct. Okay, okay. Do you think that we uh, well? Do you think that we could achieve uh, significantly more? Um, given that we've got all the uh, challenges around our long-term plan, we could achieve uh, 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 we could achieve uh, a significant amount given the extra cost to consult, uh, given the challenges we have around the long-term plan in the next sort of nine 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 months. I, I think uh, perhaps to try and answer that question, I I just refer you to paragraphs um, 33 to 38. Um, yep. that the policy or in the report? That's, that's in, the, in the report, item 11. Yep. So that that page go, 42. I, I realise that we will go out to consultation on the long-term plan. Um, um, okay, that probably is... Um, that I, I think I, I may have an answer in my own mind for that. I thought of, if we did go out to consultation, whether we could add another question on page 55, and that is because there has been quite a lot of discussion around council since the con consultation process cha changed in 2013, I think, legislatively changed. And I just wondered if a third question could be added there, assuming that we do go out to consultation, and that question would be along the lines of, do you think council could improve in the way it consults with its community on significant matters? And I can give you this afterwards anyway without writing it down now, and mm -hmm. if so, please explain below, so it adds another question to that feedback form, because we have been under the, the impression, some of us have anyway, that perhaps the changes that came in in 2013 and perhaps the way we consulted around the, 2000, uh, around the last long-term plan uh, probably didn't hit the right um, spots insofar as we believed was good feedback from our community. Yep, thank you, Councillor Pascoe. I've noted that down. Okay, all right. Um, and I had another question here. Oh, just around the costs. If we went out to consultation, would um, you've got twenty-two thousand? That's obviously about another seven thousand. Uh, does that include staff time? Uh, yes. So the there will be a um, the necessity to analyse. Yep. Um, the engagement results, uh, so that will entail some staff time. So you've got that included in the 4,000 there? That's correct. You've so got that staff time included in that? That's correct, and, yes. And if we go out to consultation, will we need to have a, will we need to, <clears throat> I may not describe this right, because uh, it's been a long day, will we need to have another session here in the in the chamber yeah, to, so take, to get that feedback? Yes, yeah, so the, essentially there will be a, another council meeting a deliberation the, hearing. Co correct. A deliberation de de hearing. Deliberations. We would present those results and you would ultimately decide whether to adopt that policy or not. Okay, all right. Um, okay, so if, um, if I may be so bold as to recommend um, as a motion uh, the, the adoption of Part B. Option, sorry, option B. Op oh, sorry, it is called option B. Yeah. yeah. Seconder. 
Uh, sorry, I've finished my questions, uh, Mayor okay. Andrew. So I will move an amendment for A, if there's a seconder. Would it be helpful if I just explain the difference between option A and option B? So essentially it's the same, it's the same draft policy in, in option A and option B. Um, the difference, option A is just adopting the policy today and then we're done, that's the policy. Option B is go out to a public consultation on that policy, then come back and um, consider whether to adopt it. So it's, it's still, we're talking about the same policy though. Well, the policy could change depending on the feedback from the yeah. consultation. Correct. So do we have a seconder? Yep, Jeff. Okay, um, Councillor Siggy. Thank you. Um, I just got one question. I mean, we, we do we do go out for lots of consultations, uh, you know, and that must have come in 2013 when they got changed. Um, is, there, is there a consultation fatigue as well that people get a bit tired of? Too much consultation or, a, I don't know, just, just a, Point I out don't there. think that's a question staff can mm. ask, though, really. Yeah, right. I, I mean, that's for the chief okay. executive, but I, I don't <laughs> think it's these guys' job okay. to decide what, what, what we should be going at. <laughs> I, I just don't think it's fair that these guys answer that question. That's yeah, all. no, no, it's cool. Okay. It's cool. Well, I, I, I think it's a relevant question, but I think it's for you to decide that. I think in you considering that is look at um, how many people actually respond to our consultations but I think uh, someone before brought up a relevant point around um, something that's been discussed at a number of been brought up a number of briefings is how effective is our engagement going forward and I think we're always looking at trying to improve that in a you know a cost effective way so Mm -hmm. um, so I don't have a simple answer for that. I think elected members will probably have their own views on that, and some of you may well have um, weighed that up when you made the decision to stand. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I just it's just yeah. We're, we're we're putting so many out, and and sometimes people get overwhelmed, or I don't know, you know. Um, that, that was just yeah. I, and I know it's hard to to even quantify. Yeah, um, do, thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. both ways. Mm. Um, I'll just move a time extension. Do we have a seconder? Thank you, Rob. Um, okay, so Councillor Gary. Thank you. Um, just on page 47, which is the actual policy, uh, you've got a second to bottom box is called strategic assets. What significant things are not mentioned in there? And the things I've noticed is the civic buildings not. Um, is that deliberately, um, and all and, and any of our other uh, parks and reserves? I don't think are, or are they covered by a special act or something? So, so the the strategic assets that are in here uh, were essentially pulled over from the existing policy. Yep, uh, so I'm just trying to find, yeah, I'm not asking you to, def I guess, it, is, what are the, sig what significant things are not included in there? And I guess, like, I've just tried to, this building isn't. So if we were going to sell this building, say, and, and lease it or become a virtual council or something like that, um, that wouldn't require consultation? Is that what that's saying? Or that would not be considered a strategic asset, beg your pardon? So, yeah, so yes, okay. that's correct. That wouldn't be considered a strategic asset. So, is this so this is based on the legislation, is it? Section S5, by the look of it? Yeah, so the, the legislation defines what a strategic asset okay. is. So the law does that for us, so we don't have to, we don't have to take care of that? Yeah, that's, that's correct. So it defines, and then uh, council uh, <coughs> determines what they are, and they've done that in the previous policy, and we've just we've moved them across to this policy. Okay, so does the legislation actually say your libraries network, your pool network, your museums and collections, or does it say something like assets that are fundamental to Western civilization or something, and you pick what they are? So essentially, if you were to look at that uh, definition, the first four lines uh, up to the point where it says the following, that is uh, that replicates what's in the legislation under Section 5 of the LGA. Oh, okay, so 
the assets that the council needs to retain if the council is to maintain its capacity to achieve blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's those correct. Things. Okay. And that comes down to us to define what we think those things are. So yep. that's, this has been an internally generated rated list. Okay. So, so am I far off by saying the big things that aren't on the, li the list are this building? Uh, for the purpose of this policy, that they haven't been defined as uh, strategic assets, although they may be assets. Yep. Under, in terms of the policy itself, they're not defined as strategic okay. assets. Uh, how about like our um, centr uh, crisis centre and a um, civil emergency or things like that considered strategic assets? Whether or not we own the buildings, the function that goes on there, or, or our, our, our use of those buildings, or that function... Yes, yeah, so they, they haven't current they haven't currently been um, in they're not currently in the policy. Um, so I guess in relation to say this building, um, it's to could council go into another building and still operate its you know deliver the same kind of level of service? Okay. The answer is probably probably yes. But the um, with relation to the um, civil defence um, activity, that's that's potentially one that could be added into here. Okay. Uh, and the regional airport even, yeah, okay. Right, thank you. Okay, so we move into debates. Um, Councillor Pascoe. Look, I, I, um, I don't favour consultation for the sake of uh, consulting to the community, but I think in this case, um, there's a, there's, the timing is right. Um, I think that we have got a large number of significant projects that we've been discussing, we're heading, now into a long-term plan um, and, um, and uh, going out for submission for submissions now uh, will get us some, if we could add in that question that I've asked about you know, how well we, how, how we could improve our consultation process, it might also be valuable when we go out to market um, the long-term plan early next year. So, um, so I, I just think it, there's a bit of a window here for us to, um, to adopt um, option two over option one. And I appreciate that there is an additional cost to it, but for the sake of a few thousand dollars, um, hopefully we might get some benefit back from it. I'm also a little wary about two assets that are on there, the Hamilton City Library and Waterworld, which are both um, uh, current assets that that I believe are at risk, um, and we're getting, I, I, I'm getting, and I presume other councillors are getting some regular feedback uh, on one or other or both of those assets. So there may well be an opportunity if um, submitters focus on either one or both of those that we may get some feedback to see where the priorities might need to be in terms of the, uh, the Central City Library and um, a as well as Waterworld. So, um, so I'm, I'm kind of uh, halfway through the door in terms of taking option two over option one, but I just think there's a kind of a little window there that, that for a few thousand dollars we might get some benefit out of that will perhaps shore us up ready for the way that we might consult um, over the long-term plan when I think it's, it's going to be a much bigger Bigger, a bigger parcel, and it's something that we have to do anyway. Thank you. Councillor Gary. Thanks, Andrew, and thanks, Rob. I, I agree I can, completely. Can, 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 Rob, I, can I take my right to speak next? I haven't put up the amendment. Sorry to interrupt. Are you, talk, are you talking to me or Rob? You, yeah. I'm just going to dive in front of you because I'm going to put the amendment up. Well, so if you don't mind me running over you, that's fine. If you're going to jive in front of me... <laughs> no, go ahead. Um, so I'm just, I've read the policy, I understand the policy, I've got my head around the policy and I don't believe there's any risk. It's 22,000 bucks, guys. Your choice, but, you know. No. We're, we're, yeah, 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 on top, yeah. Seven more, is it? Yeah. So, I mean, do we have to go out and do this? Do we have to spend the extra money? Do we have to tie up our staff? When we've read it, we understand it, we've got a hedge around it. Um, this is a more restrictive policy than what we've had in the past. This is a better policy, I believe, than what we're, you know, it's repl this is a policy that's replacing a, a more open policy and it gives much clearer direction into what we do consult on and what we don't going forward. So um, to me, it's just another layer of regulation and time, cost, money, red tape, if you like. 
and um, we don't. We, our staff have clearly told us we don't need it if we've read it and understand it and feel safe about what we're voting for. So, um, what? Why go there? Uh, sorry, Gary, to interrupt you. Thank you. I just didn't quite understand what was going on. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I'm glad you pointed out it was seven thousand, or yeah, it's, I thought it was about eight thousand, but it's yeah, it is eight thousand. <laughs> um, yeah, I and uh, this is going to sound funny coming from me, but I think eight thousand is good value for improving. If we can improve our consultation process, I don't know if we can. Um, when you look at the other big figures we bandy around in this um, chamber, eight thousand small. Um, and democracy is a funny word, and it's got lots of uh, implications. But in this situation, I think um, this is the primary, other than elections, the primary way we get to communicate with our um, our public. And I think uh, when we have got some very, very big um, hurdles ahead of us, the 10-year plan particularly, and given our financial position and the challenges that uh, confront us, I would like to make sure we got our consul consultation right. And to a certain extent, this is a bit of ass covering. By that I mean, um, just whether or not we Gary, gain any point of order. Please rephrase it. Language. A oh, bottom. This is bottom covering. Thank you. Um, but they're the same thing, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Gluteus maximus <laughs> covering. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, in that. Uh, we are going through some really significant things, or you know, the the, the f uh, finance and whatever that whatever what your thing called, finance and I, I finance finally, and plunder. I remembered what it is. It's, it was the fi uh, financial strategy and, and revenue task force, uh, also known as the finance finance and plunder <laughs> task force. Um, we're going out to the community to do some significant changes to the way we rate people, the way we collect the development contributions, the way we grow the city. Um, I don't know if we'll get any, to be honest, I'm cynical enough to think we may not get much value out of consultation, but we might get something. I know we tried, I think someone called it town hall um, consultation a couple of years ago where we had little meetings. And I mean, I don't think it worked very well, but we tried something different. I don't think it worked well. And hopefully we're not, my good friend here is calling that what? Oh, Crap. no, excrement. <laughs> Um, but but I, I, I don't think that for the cost of $8,000, and it, sorry, getting back to what I was talking about, um, I think it's important that we are seen to have made sure that we have spoken to our community. And if it means going out to, cons to spend another $8,000 to, um, to consult with our people about the way we consult with them, I think it's, not, it's, it's good money. I mean, that would be probably made up in the lunches we're not getting, isn't it? We used to pay for lunches and we don't. Uh, Councillor Casson. Um, I'm voting for the amendment. Look, um, our proposals we send out to the public, another $8,000 for um, proposals we get back what, for the parking lot, we've got 170 people. Um, you give me $100 and I'll buy some sausages and I'll do one out at uh, Rotatuna Shopping Centre, I'll get 170 people in a day. So um, I think there's better ways we can do this instead of uh, wasting money on all these proposals. Um, I reckon if every councillor got $100 to go out and buy sausages and held it in their own different places, they'd get more of a feedback than we'd ever had before. You could translate it into Māori. I could. <laughs> I could. <laughs> path, path, the path of good intentions is full of what? <laughs> I've already had that. OK, thanks very much. Deputy Mayor Gallagher. Look, um, this is a real dilemma for me because when Councillor Mallet yeah. uh, is advising that we should spend a quantum to improve our public consultation, I, I feel honour bound to listen to the wise advice of our Chair of Finance, but it is finely balanced. Less is more sometimes, Deputy Mayor. All right, we'll go just in time. Um, yeah, I, I'll be uh, supporting the um, amendment because I just think spending $7,000 to go out and consult on how we consult is perhaps a bit over-consultative. Thank you. Yeah. All right, we'll go to the board to vote. So we're voting on the amendment first. Okay, I'll use my casting vote. So we now go the. Can we just see the vote first? Is that 
Oh, I was trying to hide that. Can we read it out, please? The system is prompting for us casting votes, so the team will read the names yes, of councillors yes, for individuals. Uh, with the leave of the chair, then at that point the chair exercises a casting vote. Well, we used to have it up on the board. Yeah, okay. I know, around, they've reached it, we've been trying to get it there. Only IT. Oh, sorry. Well, might be the best. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, can we read it out, please? Yes, uh, councillors four. Uh, councillors Taylor, Bunting, Casson and Tuman. Councillors against, uh, Councillors Gallagher, Henry, Mallet, Pascoe. Where's the and King. Where, oh, King's four, sorry. <laughs> okay, so we'll now go, that becomes the motion. Oh yeah, I use my custom vote, sorry. So I, okay, sorry. So I voted for the amendment. So now the amendment becomes the substantive motion. So we're now voting on the motion. On the amendment which has become the substantive motion. The amendment is a substantive motion is carried 8-4-2 against. Did we get that right? So the policy is adopted. Okay. So the policy is adopted. Okay, we are heading now to item 15, page 143. Thank you, Ricky. Seconder. Um, there's no questions, so we'll. Uh, sorry, uh, can, uh, uh, Councillor Casson. Uh, yes, uh, Deputy Mayor Gallagher. The, the gaming funding is, is that? I, I just think, and I'm not wanting to reopen this debate because I respect the decision of previous council, but I do think something that, in the commentary, was largely was partly overlooked. Uh, and why I'm very comfortable with the um, recommendation uh, from the uh, Community and Services Committee is because we also um, are a regulator in this area, and I think this makes it a much cleaner, in my view, that we don't then become a beneficiary of funds that we are actually in the process of, of the regulating authority. So I, I just add that in there. I don't want to open up debate, and I respect there's legitimate debate on both sides. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Gary, uh, Mellet, sorry. Yep. Um, just relitigating the debate. Uh, <laughs> um, and I just remind people that every dollar that we don't get from a gambling trust that has been voluntarily put into a gambling machine uh, is a dollar that involuntarily has to come from a rate payer. <clears throat> so I will be voting. Um, against this change. <clears throat> Just one, one other Very quick question, um, Mayor yeah. Andrew, and that's something that came up after the after the vote, and I'm not sure whether staff have have an answer to it. But is a gambling machine the same as a as a lotto machine? No. Um, is it the same as um, a machine? Um, d does our policy now extend? to any um, trusts who we might apply to who have as part of their investments uh, investments in uh, organisations that um, have shares in the likes of Sky City and other uh, listed public companies involved in gambling? This is class four gambling only. So it only involves only the, the machines, machines that we are the regulate, that we have uh, uh, an ability 
as a council to regulate the numbers um, and where no, and from memory um, when I read it it was all class poker machines gambling. any class four gambling and they're specified as poking machines not even the ones in casinos the ones in bars okay and, and licensed under the act <coughs> so so a poker machine in Sky City is under a different class that's correct okay thank yep. you for that. so just to clarify uh, Mayor Andrew and councillors um, that was one thing that we changed a few words in the policy just to make that very clear we're only talking about class four gambling machines okay have are you aware of any because I am aware of uh, a few council facilities eg a, a big rugby stadium here, here very very close to here that um, could significantly be affected by this no I am not aware of that I don't have that level of detail okay. I'm sorry councillor if there's something specifically you'd like us to investigate um, we have um, to take that away councillor Gary just to be really clear mm. Um, say it's Northern District's cricket, they're no, not. It's the, it's the, it's the no, no, stadium. no, but just say it's oh, Northern okay. District cricket, right and they were applying yeah. for nets, and Pardon? they and they were applying for a new set of nets, yeah. and those nets are their property, not ours, so they're not on our books. We don't depreciate them, even although they're leasing our facility, and they could still apply because they aren't Hamilton City Council. They are Northern District's cricket. Or if it was Old Boys Rugby Club, even although they're in one of our facilities, if they're applying, they aren't Hamilton City Council. No, it's the bigger rugby stadium. Well, how's that affected? I, mean, I understood for some, for some reason I thought the Waikato Rugby Union, they're the tenant of... Uh, yeah, but they're not Hamilton they're City the Council. They're Northern District, so it's the same yeah. thing. That's the rugby union, not Hamilton well, City Council. I've seen Council. correspondence that suggests there is some implication, some impact on them. With regards to this, well, it's certainly they? not the intention to stop. Um, it was never the intention to stop other not-for-profits okay, applying. Well, may, for maybe there's a misunderstanding on someone's behalf because I've seen I've seen correspondence which suggests that um, they generally get pay a lot of their rent for the stadium from a contribution from grassroots. And this is this will all be public information. You may not know it, but it's public information. Um, and their, their understanding is, I think, and I may have misread this. I may have this wrong that they would not be able to get that funding. This is probably a very good time for Julie to clarify. Mm. Thank um, you. Just to clarify, um, in clause 10 of the proposed policy, we've added the words in um, directly, so that actually means it's talking about council only applying, not anyone, for example, who leases our facilities. So we have tried to clarify that um, with adding the word directly to that. That's one of the changes that we have done. Can, can you uh, give, do you know who Blair Foot is? No. He's the CEO of the Waikato Rugby Union. Just, oh, I'll talk to you after. Yeah. Well, maybe Gary can go direct. Mm. They, they may misunderstand what it, mm. it does yeah. too. Yeah. It certainly wasn't us telling other people what they could and couldn't do. No. I think they thought because it was a council-owned uh, facility that they couldn't. Okay. Okay. Um, so should we go to the vote here? So we're voting on the staff recommendation. Uh, well, should we just? Oh. Okay, we're ready. The motion is carried eight four one against. Okay, we'll um, now resolve to exclude the public. So um, moved by Councillor Tooman, seconded by Councillor Casson. Thank you, Julie.